Good evening and welcome to the select board meeting of July 23rd, 2018. It's, uh, I'm calling meeting order at 6.30 p.m. Um, we'll start as usual with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Um, are there anything regarding the agenda that any of my colleagues need to mention or, or note to me about that? Um, I don't believe anyone's here for public comment, so we'll probably dispense with that this evening just because there's no one here for that. Um, of courtesy to someone who is here for a non-public comment, but an item on our agenda, but heaven knows when we get to it if we don't do it first. So we'll, uh, we'll under uh, item seven, licenses, public way, and metered parking reservations. We have a couple of items um, that I believe Mr. Turkell is here for. So if you want to step up, announce your name at the, at the uh, you didn't mic and take really a Really look to see if we had any comments Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you have anything? I'm sorry. I kind of zip through that without exactly. giving you a chance to sort of breathe or, or offer a suggestion. I uh, thank you. I would like to suggest that although we really appreciate that the minutes got prepared for us and that our clerk looked at them, I wonder if later we might take a brief reading period to go ahead and read them because I couldn't, given the other things that were already on our desk tonight, I couldn't read them all before we got started. No, that's perfectly so fine. We take I that was going to suggest later. that or delay Great. them to our next meeting, but probably that. Will work just because it'll be a few weeks till our next right. meeting. So. Right, exactly. So, if you would be so kind as to introduce yourselves and then uh, tell us about uh, why you're here. Sure. Uh, my name is Bear Tierkel, uh, Amherst resident. I'm Oliver Brody, <coughs> executive director of Amherst Live. And uh, Amherst Live is a, a local nonprofit uh, that we founded. Uh, in 2012, I believe, uh, to bring arts and culture to our downtown area. Um, we're a nonprofit 501c3 corporation. We've thrown um, seven events so far uh, over the last five years, uh, and then plus five more Ignite Amherst events um, that we, we hosted in Amherst. Um, uh, Amherst Live is Oliver, myself, and Tony Morales, um, and a host of volunteers from the town of Amherst that uh, bring these shows off. Um, the market for our, our events uh, is generally homeowners uh, between the ages of you know 30 and 65. Uh, we're not really focused on the student population. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as bringing arts and culture to the downtown for, for adults. Um, we found have found over the years of doing these events, there's limited venues really for us to, to do these events in Amherst. Um, so we tend to look at, you know, event spaces that can be act as venues that are kind of out of the norm. Um, so, you know, we think that's a great way, rather than having to build a whole new building for a venue, let's repurpose different spaces around town to hold events in. We think it's a lot of fun, and people who come to the events think it's a lot of fun. Uh, this particular event that we're here in front of you guys tonight for, um, is going to be held on is planned to be held on August 4th from 8 to 11. Um, the event's an eclectic mix of graffiti art, old school TV, and live jazz. Um, we've done an extensive amount of a planning around the event, um, which we'll walk you through tonight. Um, as and just to give you a heads up, somebody might have mentioned it in the past. Uh, in our marketing for the event, we're keeping the uh, venue, the location of the event, secret. And uh, much like in, in New York and California, these events are kind of under the cover and the patrons find out about them really where they're going to be on the day of the event. And in our case, we're going to send an email to everybody uh, two days before the event. That helps build the hype around the event. And people kind of get excited to try to figure out where it's going to be. Um, although you all know where it's going to be because it's in your packet. Um, so, you, so you may want to ask the press not to reveal the location. At that, that is time. why I mentioned without pointing that out specifically. <laughs> um, so uh, we have sponsors for this event. Um, uh, the Amherst Bid is one of our partners. Uh, we've been working closely with them um, on the event. AJ Hastings is is a host uh, is a uh, sponsor as well as a number of other local Amherst businesses. Uh, the event's going to be completely on private property. Um, I think you have a map of the layout of the event in your uh, packet. Um, 
we are planning on serving, as with all of our events, we have served alcohol at, and we've never, never had a problem with that. Um, at this event, there will be beer, and we're making a special, because it's the height of summer, alcoholic snow cones uh, that will be served at the event. Um, and these will be sold along with food at the event. Um, as with all of our events, uh, we have hired a professional and licensed uh, company to manage the alcohol sales. Uh, and food sales. Uh, in this case, it's Bistro 63 Monkey Bar. Uh, they have the training and tools and experience uh, along with a serve safe trained staff of professionals uh, that have a pretty deep experience level in ensuring that uh, we serve alcohol in a safe way uh, and a legal way, um, keeping focus on the fact that uh, on preventing underage uh, serving from happening and also any, anybody from underage um, getting any alcohol from anybody, any of the other patrons. Um, we've met uh, at the event site with both uh, Captain Gunderson from the Amherst Police Department as well as Assistant Chief Stromgren from the Amherst Fire Department and done a walkthrough of uh, the event plan and our strategy, our layout, our exits, our entrances, the control points uh, for the event. Uh, and they've approved of the plan and our approach for the event. Uh, we've worked with the town manager's team, uh, as well as uh, Jeff Kravitz, the economic development director, the planning department, the health department, the police department, fire department, uh, in putting the event together. Um, in fact, at our last meeting, one of the suggestions uh, that the uh, staff made to us was that we make the event a 21-plus event. It was all ages, although we expected probably 95% to be over 21, uh, but we've switched it, so now it's a 21-plus event. Um, Worked with Susan Malone in the, in the health department on the food aspects and permitting, with Jen Garnett in, in planning on general permitting, uh, town manager staff um, on, on the overall plan itself. Um, we've done the tax at attestation form, the workers' compensation form, the live entertainment license form, the porta potty permit, and the one day liquor license, which I think we're, we're here for tonight. Um, We've also received, I think, uh, a list of questions from the select board, um, which we sent back, and I hope the answers are in your packet um, that are there, uh, including the map of, of what the layout is. Uh, we've worked with the neighbors uh, around the venue um, to make sure that uh, they're aware of it, that they're bought into it. We've talked to all the landlords. Um, the only residential units that are nearby, um, the property manager of that unit thinks he he said he thinks 100% of the tenants are not in town uh, as the, there's, it's student housing. But uh, even if, if that's not true, we are uh, uh, putting flyers in all of the tenants um, and we've spoken personally with all the businesses around it. Um, and we have not had any, any issues that have been brought to our attention yet. Uh, the area will be cordoned off from the public. Um, we'll have two staffed entrances and exits. Uh, we'll have signage um, to identify really where, where the event is um, so that people know not to bring alcohol um, outside of the, uh, the event. That's kind of the, the summary. So I'll start with one simple question to start with. Sure. If someone who is watching us tonight wanted to go to the event, how would they be able to do that? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> Since you want uh, people if, to go. If somebody, we do. Uh, if somebody's interested in attending, uh, the, we're, it's the, the Amherst Live High Summer Pop-Up Party and TV Revival. Uh, and you can find out information about it and get tickets at amherstlive.com. Great. Thank you for that. Are there questions for my colleagues? Ms. Brewer. So I have some additions I'd like to make to the motion. So if we could write, just jot those down at this point. And then I also have a question about the questions that were referenced in that we don't have any question and answer things in our packet. We do have maps, which is great. But if there was a list of other questions that haven't in fact already been covered by the presenters, it would be good to know those. But in the meantime, we don't have any email. The, the two applications are listed under items B and C, as yes. I understand it, and I would like to ensure that someplace in the motion for B that includes the fact that it's a 21 plus event, so wherever that seems to fit. And the other is on item C to make it clear that Oliver Brody is executive director of Amherst Live because Amherst Live is not actually specifically mentioned within this 
long motion <laughs> that we always stitch together with all the pieces of information, which we will include the location because it's a public meeting. So we just you just hope no one's watching our meeting. <laughs> and we need to add to that that Bistro, this is not their fault because we've talked before about the fact that we don't clarify this on the alcohol application, but we need to show that Bistro 63 is doing the actual alcohol service. Most people don't think to put that on the application because they're applying, they're making the application and they're meeting with the chief of police. But when we have the caterer, a caterer for example, um, someone who is trained and we always say, well, don't you have somebody who's trained if they don't offer that information? And so we should include the fact that Bistro 63 is associated with this. So uh, in order to not read the motion, uh, in therefore, which includes an address. Um, what I was thinking in response to what you were just doing is, while um, everybody else is reading the minutes that I've already read, I will do some changes to the motions that are part of the consent motion. And by then including this as consent motion, we don't have to publicly state what the address is because it won't be verbalized. So we can honor everybody's wishes. You would ask about the questions. So yeah. this came up, but I believe in advance of agenda setting, maybe at agenda setting, but um, really all the things that Mr. Turkel sort of went through with you know police fire egress, no neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are all the, the, all the questions we ask. <laughs> right. And it was just, you know, I mean, again, as I stated to, um, to Ms. Mills, as she liaised for us on this, uh, you know, this isn't about trying to stop something like this. We want these kinds of things. This is a nice event. Um, we just want to do it right so people can be safe and smart and healthy and, you know, good neighbors and all that sort of stuff. So we just sort of pose some sort of worst case scenario questions for the sake of trying to get uh, everybody thinking deeply about it so that we don't have any problems. Those are great. I, I have it in front of me. I can read them really quick if anybody wants to hear the questions and answers. Up to you guys. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, I have a copy of it as well. And I think you addressed all the questions. The only one that didn't come up was um, how will you prevent open container violations? And the written response was we will have signs to tell attendees that they cannot bring alcohol outside the event boundaries. Pretty much everything else were questions that you pre addressed or the select board members had asked. I always have my standard questions that everybody expects me to ask about any alcohol. Um, special alcohol licenses that are outside the usual and this is outside the usual in that uh, it's being requested by a nonprofit organization that's not normally a seller of alcohol. Um, I think that uh, most of the questions have actually already been answered by Mr. Kell in uh, his uh, presentation because he mentioned that uh, Bistro 63 is actually the one that is um, going to run the bar and that they have the professionalism and the expertise um, on assuring compliance um, and uh, including age and service and people trying to sneak in by some other mechanism. And I think that um, uh, I do have one additional question just to clarify Ms. Brewer's point. The other thing that um, always is there is that um, we do get concerned about um, making decisions to sell alcohol to people who are obviously already sufficiently intoxicated that it is not wise. <laughs> and um, again, because you have um, Bistro 63 administering the event, I think that they are well aware of the issue and so that that takes care of that. Um, is it restricted, the event itself, to people who are 21? Um, so it's age restricted, nobody can bring anybody or otherwise purchase and you are on your own checking that aside from the alcohol sales. Correct, so it, it really gives us two, you know, two levels of security there in terms of age. Uh, entrance to the event, which we'll be doing, but then and we, I just met with the Monkey Bar folks on Friday. Even though we're doing that, they're still going to be focused on, you know, car, getting ID from people. 
when they serve the alcohol and doing their usual serve safe to make sure that they're only serving uh, of age folks. Online ticketing is also explicit as to age limits. And, and one of the things um, by keeping the event locale secret, uh, you know, because it's an outdoor space, you know, and it's not like in the middle, it's not it's not in the common uh, that you know you got to kind of know about it and have a ticket because only the ticket holders will be alerted where the location is to get to it. So it's you know pretty secluded because of that. Are there other questions for Mr. Mr. Turkell or Mr. Brody? If not, then I think we'll probably, as Mr. Steinberg suggested, we'll take this up potentially fold it into our consent calendar and then be able to not reveal your location. But again, That's people awesome. can get tickets at AmherstLive.com. AmherstLive.com, I hope you all uh, attend. We'd love to see you guys there. Thank you both for your time tonight. Thank you so appreciate much. It. We appreciate it. All right, so we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, let's move up to our action discussion items and we'll start with uh, shade tree regulations, which is next on our, our list. Um, we had a copy of that here yet. Okay. I didn't know if do you want to do Amherst, the uh, South Amherst Common? Yeah. So if, if those folks aren't here just yet, then why don't we move ahead and we'll go the, uh, we'll talk to Mr. Mooring and Mr. Hayden about uh, South Amherst Common traffic flow and some temporary changes to, uh, to that. I think we got a larger sized map with some arrows on it. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm Aaron Hayden. This is for the uh, our audience at home. I'm Aaron Hayden, the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee and Guilford Mooring, Director of Public Works, is here tonight. Um, just to give you the background for the recommendation, the, the um, advice that we'd be giving to you on handling a little matter that came to our attention at the South Amherst Common. This is different than the South Common. This is the uh, the green space that's at the intersection of a half a dozen roads, Shea Street, Middle Street, Southeast Street, East, Southeast Street, North, Station Road. It's, um, it's a bit of a, of a spider web. The uh, Transportation Advisory Committee is working with ways of understanding concerns that our community has for, tra for things, transportation. Um, the South Amherst Common, uh, a concern regarding the traffic flowing through the, the cut through, as you can see from the map there, there's a cut through the middle of the, the common space. There have been a number of scary incidents there um, that have been reported to us. And in deciding that maybe this is something we would want to advise you on and taking some steps to, to deal with, uh, we did a little homework and we found out that in fact the South Amherst Common has been a source of comments for many, many years. This is not a new problem, it's new to us. Of course, we're new as well, so uh, it is new to us. And the, uh, the problems were particularly acute involving some uh, reported very near, I guess a, it's a, a near hit, it's a, it would be a miss, not a near miss. <laughs> the um, specifically, the um, inferred stop sign, and we all remember from our driving manual days that when your road ends, it's a, it's a stop sign, whether there's a, an, a physical octagon there or not, you stop and then before you make the turn. So that virtual stop sign at the end of that little cutoff is mostly honored by being ignored. And, and that's, that's a principal problem. People uh, use it as if it's an extension of the left-hand turn off of Shea Street, a little bit further to the west, and come whistling through there. Uh, several years ago, probably 15 by now, the, the four-way stop between Middle Street, Shea Street, and the 
western half of, of Southeast Street um, was changed from a two-way stop because of, actually there were some accidents there, some very serious accidents, to a four-way stop. And that did solve a number of the problems. This cut through, though, uh, generated a number of requests of us. Um, and we, after looking at it for a little bit, realized that what we really wanted to do as sort of developing a process for handling things like this is um, have a public hearing. Um, and I use that term incorrectly. It wasn't a public hearing. It was an advertised public meeting that we invited the neighbors to come and, and uh, share their ideas about what was going on at that intersection. We held it at the Munson Library, hopeful that that would make it easier for people who are directly affected by any recommendation we would make could be there to give us comment. Uh, we actually had a pretty good turnout. I was, I was pleased with a dozen or so neighbors who showed up and shared with us a wide range of ideas. They were almost unanimous in um, accepting, suggesting, asking for us to block the, the cut through off completely, which is the recommendation that you have in front of you. In the course of our speaking with the neighbors and understanding the traffic flow around that area a little bit better, uh, we realized that there might be some consequences to that, some traffic patterns being pushed from one place to another. The, um, nonetheless, we all felt that it was worth making the experiment, finding out if all the good engineering, the good designing that goes into this kind of plan worked here in this particular instance. The one modification that came out of the meeting is the um, blocking off the right-hand turn into the cutoff, the slip lane in between the western branch of Southeast Street and Shea Street. That's a very acute angle, and there's some traffic that could not go to the four-way stop and then be able to turn left to head north on Southeast Street. So we're going to allow them to use that slip lane to make that left end. Uh, Shea Street, I'm sorry, under Shea Street. We're gonna allow them to use that slip lane to be able to make that corner. That's, that's a little detail that is in the drawing there. In fulfilling sort of the, the um, uh, the nature of exploration, of trying to figure out if this is really the right thing. We are recommending that the barriers, the three barriers that we show there, are installed a couple of weeks into September, after, after the, uh, the traffic patterns in, uh, in the town have taken their, made their big shift into the fall <laughs> mode. Before that installation, at, at, at the beginning of September and until they're installed, we would, would recommend taking traffic counts and doing a little traffic study to understand how the normal traffic, the usual traffic is, and then compare that with the traffic patterns after those barriers are put in. Um, I'm hoping that we'll find it works perfectly and the concerns about driving faster traffic onto the western branch of Southeast Street won't happen because there are stop signs there and other form, road forms that do calm traffic when they're headed that way. Um, we're hoping that we find out that that speeding doesn't happen there and that the, we would make the recommendation that the barriers become permanent. So that's the, uh, the long story and behind that very short document. And I, I don't know if Mr. Mooring would like to add something to that. Just answer questions and we're delighted to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Questions from the board? I can start. Uh, okay. uh, one question, I guess I'm just trying to picture it. Right now you're um, just planning to put on do not enter signs as a method or are you actually planning to put temporary barriers um, across at that cross point. So to keep this kind of like so you can see everything on it, if I started putting a whole bunch of stuff, it would clutter it a lot. So yes, there are going to be permanent Jersey barriers across there, so you would not be able to drive down the, drive across and cut through either way. Just to follow up on that, on the, on the 
essentially right turn lane uh, coming off of Southeast Street onto Shays, where you're going to allow one-way traffic there. Are you going to, on the Shays Street end of that, is there's a barrier there to block? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's barely a lane. It's a lane wide and a little bit. It's not like two lanes per se, which is part of why it's confusing in that area. But I didn't know what your plan was on the Shays Street end of that little piece as well. There's going to be a barrier there, but it's not going to be a Jersey barrier. We're probably going to put up, we have some of the, more like you see on the highway where there are actually slats and the bars and they actually can get hit and not tear your vehicle apart. We have a couple of those we're going to put there um, and put no do not enter signs for that side. But there won't be Jersey barriers there. Okay. People will be able to make use that roadway to make that one turn that you were talking about right. if I understood Yes, it. you'll be able to make a right-hand turn if you're heading south on Southeast Street and turn on to Shea Street there. Right. Yeah. Some people That's, call that Middle Street too. I know, I was uh, actually looking at the map and uh, thinking, geez, Southeast Street is really on both sides uh, technically. East which branch is, and West Branch. Yeah. Which West is something branch. that uh, in, in my uh, 40 years here, I guess I didn't know until I looked at this map. Um, there was um, two other questions, or one question, one comment. Um, the, uh, let's see if I get it. Um, what are the traffic counts that you're going to be looking at and what will they tell you? So there's a couple of things. We've actually, as Mr. Hayden alluded to, this has been an issue that's been talked by the town for many years. Jim Smith, when he was here, he actually proposed something to alleviate all the issues going on here. So we have traffic counts that come from probably late 80s. That's when he did it. We did traffic counts around 2004. So we'll do traffic counts now. So one thing we're looking at is how things have changed over the time period. How, how, how are people using it, what are the speeds and so forth. The second thing we're gonna look at is once we put in the barricades and stop people from crossing over um, the cut through, we wanna know, we wanna quantify how much traffic is gonna be on the west side of the common. Um, there was concern about the residents who live on the west side, how much more traffic is that gonna put in front of their house? Um, and how then so, go how fast is it gonna go? Um, there's actually been, over the years, there's been several options for identifying the entire common, which has been kind of interesting. Every time we get a request for doing something in the South Common, it's like, do this. And as you start looking at doing this, you realize, well, you got to do this. And then you do move things to this, and you move things here and there. Um, in 2004, when we actually looked at it, there was, came down with three options, and it actually encompassed the entire common. Um, and we're kind of seeing it now. We said, stop traffic from using the cut-through. Well, if you stop traffic from using the cut-through, there'll be more traffic on the west side of the common. So the, we want to quantify that with the counts, and we want to get the speeds as well. Mr. Wall, do you have a question? No, no, well, my comment, just so I can conclude, uh, if I may, is the hard thing, another hard thing for many drivers, sometimes if you're injured and have a sore neck, it is particularly a problem, is where would I'll call now the two branches of Southeast Street come together and you're coming on the west branch and but you're heading north and you have the stop sign and have to really turn back at a very strong angle to look back to make sure no one's coming. Um, and of course, this is not doing anything to address that problem for people either with sore necks or not. Um, the way that people have um, frequently addressed that problem is to do one of the two cut-throughs and then make a more natural left turn. Um, and uh, so I was wondering if you had talked about that and I was interested in the fact that you didn't do anything on it, but the other is, uh, this will now force anybody who wants to uh, avoid that phenomenon that I talked about will have to use the station road cut through, and uh, that could actually have a traffic effect there, too. It could. Um, one of the things that I pretty rapidly learned 
in the course of our discussion with the, the public that afternoon is that there are many, many problems here. And we really weren't ready to solve all of them. So you mentioned the, the um, it's funny, I think of it as uh, East Street splitting, not coming together at that point, but you, that, that, that peculiar sort of Y intersection, that was a problem that was raised. There are a number of concerns around the, uh, the station road entrance, uh, the station road intersection with the east branch of Southeast Street. Um, there's a funny, I, I don't know what, it, what the phenomenon is, but people seem to approach that intersection way too fast from any of the four directions, well, principally the three directions that aren't a parking lot. Uh, there's also the, when Southeast Street comes back together again at, after Shea Street has met it, people heading north there. There's another, you know, the road turns a little bit and then you can either continue bearing left or make a slight turn right to enter that east branch of Southeast Street. And that was another intersection that came up and that was a concern. And then the intersection where Pomeroy meets Middle Street and, and then further on Shea Street. There's a lot of work that can be done here. And we heard a lot of it. And in fact, one of the reasons that I was interested in re reviewing and presenting the various plans that have happened, have been considered in the past around that area is that this may be just the first step. Um, I'm hopeful that with the counting that we're going to be doing, the, the observation that we're going to be doing. Sue Hugis, she's great. She's a great observer. She's going to tell us exactly any benefits or effects that um, our changes will have, um, that we'll begin to understand better maybe how to address those other nearby intersections. First things first. Okay. Mr. Wall, did you have a question? Similar question. I mean, having experienced also the Sarnac uh, question of <laughs> I was thinking, though, in addition about the, if I'm coming up Shays Street um, from Route 116 West Street, you know, and then I want to make, it, then I want to go north. Um, I guess to what extent is this left just to the ingenuity of the individual driver, or will there be any kind of guidance in trying to direct people? You know, if you're going to go. Uh, one thing we also do in Massachusetts is we don't label our streets. So if you're a stranger here, you have no idea what your street you're on. You may have a street. You know, you're, you're supposed to know what street you're on. You might find the street you're crossing, but every, everything after that's kind of a crapshoot. So I guess if there's, will there be guidance for people who are trying to navigate this or it'll just be left to natural traffic flow? Not yet. <laughs> I want to say something snarky, but I won't. <laughs> Um, they'll be they'll be for the first turn we, we have as we've been looking at this we've kind of come up now with two signs we were just gonna do one sign but there was gonna be a sign telling people go up to the intersection and turn left um, we probably are also gonna put a second sign that trucks go straight and then, then turn and so trucks will turn if you're a truck you're gonna probably find it more comfortable to turn in front of the church not in at the first one. So we're now up to about two signs as we kind of work through how we're going to implement this. And But there will be more signage. And we, we haven't flushed it all out, but we will get it all flushed out. And we'll probably get another option. Someone will probably say we well, should do something else too. But that's what we're planning right now. Ms. Brewer. So just some clarifications. And you've already addressed much of it associated with the signage. And I appreciate what you said about only fitting so many signs on a map this size. But I want to make sure I'm, I'm a little uneasy about the, the, which you did not write, but the motion that we have in front of us, which says, as specified by the superintendent, which we're supposed to guess is public works, I guess. But um, it doesn't reference a particular map. There's no written memo associated with this beyond the, the notes that are on the map. I'm a little fuzzy on some of this, so I'm wondering if we might find a way of, perhaps since, there, since the map thing, since the sign thing is still being worked out, maybe what it make, makes sense to do is to say, you know, as generally outlined at the July 19th meeting and with the map of July 19th, and then expect that once it all gets installed, that it'll be, will get copied in on what it actually looks like, so that then when we're evaluating it someday, we'll know what that signage was, rather than asking anybody to go back and fix it now. 
but we often have either a map that tells us exactly what we're going to do or a memo that tells us exactly what we're going to do and this does some of that and it talks about how to do it but the question the first question associated with are we talking jersey barriers are we talking signage i appreciate all the detail you've given us i just would like it somehow to be clearer to the future body that mm. sees this what it is we actually did and so maybe the best way of addressing that is just saying that it kind of once not that you come back here for permission but that you come back you just send us a map <laughs> that has all the things you ended up doing and showing you know where the jersey barriers are etc and then that can be added to the future packet when it's time to evaluate this yeah the right question i have in this is just for my colleagues is uh, do we need to specify the dates of the that would be a you know, good idea because it's there's no written plan uh, how temporary is temporary i mean you indicated a couple of weeks do we know kind of the, the date range we should probably identify that in in our motion if we're going to close the street for a period of time so people have an expectation of yes, when thank you that's important you have to we were we were going to propose some dates, but we're not actually sure which dates we want to propose yet due to a couple of things. One, there's the election. So you have uh, the preliminary, our, our primary elections will be on September 4th. The question is, do we want to put the counters out before then or after then? We're leaning towards putting the counters out after the election because that's going to give us a fall tie day and a fall tie time period. So we're not, we don't, if you want to put some dates in, it would be two weeks prior to the installation, two weeks after installation. It would be the best dates I have right now because we're trying to figure out what would be the best days. If Tuesday is the primary, we might wait, wait until Saturday, have them in for Saturday, count Saturday, or we might wait until Monday and then count. Um, and that we haven't worked out yet as well because it also relies on the company that's coming in to do the counting. Right. So I think from the standpoint of the counts, because that doesn't obstruct traffic in any way, that's whatever dates work is probably fine. I think it's actually more, my concern is more about uh, when are we actually gonna put in the barrier to that section and the dates that we're gonna have that in place, which is temporary until we analyze the data, I presume, and then, so do you know the dates that we're bringing those in place? No, because, I mean, like I said, we wanted to have at least two solid weeks of counting before we actually put them in. Okay. So if we start on Wednesday after the primary, that's two weeks after Wednesday. If we start the Saturday after the primary, okay. that's two weeks after that Saturday. Um, so there's, what, you, what we're gonna do is we'll have it all done in September is the way we're, where we're looking at it now. So that's what we're looking for. That's why we like written memos and that sort of <laughs> thing. Is, so September, we could say September, um, 2018 and then that way it's whenever in September for the counts and then the installation but then what's the end date <coughs> what's the end date for having I'm not talking about the counts anymore I'm talking about the signage what what's your period of time so the time period was after we do the counts for after they go in the barriers no, are in when there's it's two when weeks. we're ready to evaluate what are we feel like our results have been are we talking about next february are we talking about no. december i mean what are we looking at we're looking at very closely after we get all the count data back so it's probably about two weeks it takes about two weeks after they're all done to give us the numbers back and have actual something more than just numbers on the table so that's how it normally goes so, so looking at october before we get data back and probably <clears throat> Sometime in October, it'll go to the TAC, and then it'll come back to you. As maybe you understand yeah. my question. So, so I think maybe the easiest way to do it is that the select board would be authorizing that little section of road for the, the traffic changes as recommended to be um, initiated on or about September 21st or some other day like that for two weeks. And then that'll give you, that gives you, two, we can choo choose whatever date you want, but you're going to start a two-week time clock from whatever that first day is, say it's September 22nd, then you keep it closed for two weeks and then it opens up again. That's fine. Is that the, is that the goal? Is that what you intend is to, while you, are you gonna reopen it while you do all the analysis or are you gonna keep it closed while you do all the analysis? The goal was to reopen it. That's kind of the impression that the committee left with the residents. We're gonna do the counts, then come back and evaluate them and then propose a more permanent solution. 
so still confused. So I understand the part about doing the counts before put the signs in. I understand the counts need to take place on an appropriate date, not voting date. Um, I understand that it will take more than five minutes to install what is actually relatively massive signage and barriers, et cetera. It's gonna take at least a couple of hours to put that in. And then the question I'm trying to understand is, how long is the stuff gonna be there? before just for two weeks and then and take it out and then but do a count during the two-week period so a count prior account for the two weeks <coughs> it's really only gonna sit there for two weeks yes really okay. well it's gonna sit across the road for two weeks yes okay if and things... then you're gonna pull everything out and put it back to the way it was even though you may or may not have your you, you will have collected your data during that time period, but it will be gone by the end of September. Should, yes. Okay, roughly. Right, the, the, one of the principal goals in this, of course, is to end up with a safer intersection ultimately, but this series of actions is really to understand whether this is the thing that is best done there. So put it in, check it out, and then double check. Now, if it's going so well, we could do like the, the cancer trials where they just prove the drug and off you go. But I, I don't expect that, actually. That's what I'm trying to understand, is that it's not going to then be that at the end of September we say, well, you know, we're kind of liking the way this looks. Let's leave it in until November or December or January. So I'm just trying to understand what the goal is here. And it's this very short period of time. And if that's the way you want to do it, I'm fine with that. I'm just trying to understand what it is. The goal is to have it in for a very short period of time. If someone else along the way decides, oh, that's great, but right now the goal is just to have it in for the two weeks to count, get the data, and then decide what to do next. But everything will come out. Other questions? So you said the approximate date you were thinking of was uh, September, the, when in September? I'm just trying to think of a motion. And it's the Wednesday, either the Wednesday after elections or it's going to be the Saturday after the election. So the election is on, the primary election is on the 4th, 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 right. Either the 5th or the 8th. But, but you're not doing anything those, for, you're just going to be counting traffic those you're first two counting. weeks. And then it's, it's two weeks after that date that you're going to, that the select board has to take an action. Right. If we go to the 22nd, right. yeah. so if you go to the 8th and you two weeks, it's the 22nd. Two right. weeks gets us into October. It's, so what I was thinking is if you're going to do a motion that would be like that, it would be to, to approve temporary traffic flow changes for study of traffic flow on the Southeast Common as specified by the superintendent specifically for a two week period beginning on or about September 22, 2018 to block and then go on from there, then you've put in both the two-week period and the blockage date. Could you repeat that, the, the September so, part? So you go from specifically for a two-week period beginning on or about September I, it, there is no specification from the superintendent here. There's a description, and so I'm, I'm not good with calling it that. So can we just say as described by the superintendent of public works and supported by the TAC because we always like to give the TAC credit for the work that they've done. Because otherwise we'd say, well, what did the TAC say? So, so you would put um, as described? By the superintendent of public works and recommended and recommended by the train. okay weather permitting <laughs> well said, honor yeah. about Th that's why i did the honor about yes I, honor about uh, nice because that. we have to pull the tubes and the counters when it snows if uh, you determine <laughs> uh, for whatever reason that you need to vary it slightly you can't have it crafted in a way to offer a motion? Yes, I think uh, I can try and do that. Did I move to approve 
temporary traffic flow, flow changes for study of traffic flow on the South Amherst Common as described by the Superintendent of Public Works and recommended by the Transportation Advisory Committee specifically for a period of two weeks beginning on or about September 22, 2018 to block the shortcut across South Amherst Common that is an extension of Shea Street east towards Southeast Street to block the first left turn from Shea Street to Southeast Street going eastbound to allow southbound Southeast Street traffic to take first right into Shea Street and to perform traffic counts before these changes and after these changes are made. Is there a second? Excellent. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous with one member absent. So thank you both very, very much. Well, thank you indeed. So next up, we'll go back to, uh, since I think they're here, mm -hmm. the shade tree regulations. Mm -hmm. We'll go back on our agenda to the shade tree regulations. Um, so I think Mr. Slaughter? Yes. If I may be so bold as to interrupt like I just did, which would be to say, could someone tell us why this is in our packet and what we're doing rather than jumping right into having a presentation from the shade tree folks? Because I, the whole, we did a town meeting article, we talked about it before. I'm a little uneasy just leaping in and saying, present the regulations to us. I mean, we've seen a variation of this before. We had comments. We don't know that they were incorporated. We don't have any documentation that says they were incorporated, except we have a new document to read. So I'd like s some clarity on where we're at. Mm -hmm. sure. So the last time this came to the board, it was in, in the form of a bylaw that was presented to, was to be presented to uh, town meeting. Uh, there was so much specificity in the bylaw, it was recommended to the shade, public shade, shade tree committee that they, uh, especially by town council, I think, was to minimize the actual bylaw and to put everything else into a regulation that the select board would be authorized to approve or not approve. So this is these are the regulations that were the more detailed, which you had seen before because it was presented as part of the bylaw, but they were extracted from the bylaw and put into a regulation for you to approve. I might follow up. My frustration is that we didn't weren't provided with Article 12 to remind us of what we were doing, and for all five of us to go digging out that information feels frustrating to me. Um, and I would also have liked some intro from either from the town manager or from the Shade Tree organization to tell us we incorporated these three things since the last time we talked about this. I'm betting they'll probably cover that in their presentation, but it would have helped me read this differently than going back and looking at the original bylaw and putting together our notes again, et cetera. Yeah, no, I think that's my fault for not putting that in context, which would have context made it help you. So. Yeah, I understand. So, given that. Also, I'll apologize for us being late. I thought the meeting started at 7.05, so, yeah. That's all right. You were fine. Right on time. <laughs> we had other things. We can always fill the time generally, so you're fine. So, if you'd introduce yourselves and then tell us a little bit about uh, the regulations that are in front of us tonight. Yeah, I'm Henry Lappin. I'm the chair of the Public Shade Tree Committee. I'm Alan Snow, tree warden with the town of Amherst. Okay. Um, so, we're here tonight. Uh, thank you for taking the time to discuss uh, strengthening our town tree laws uh, for public shade trees. So these are trees that are within the public way under the um, already kind of regulated by Mass General Law Chapter 87, um, which also would include scenic roads in that, which would require a joint hearing with the planning board and tree warden. Um, what we would like to do is simply, simply take the policy that I've been using for the past uh, six years or seven years um, and turn that policy into actual you know, bylaw with the town. Um, and the Shade Tree Committee has spent a significant amount of time uh, researching other communities and the, their bylaws that extend uh, Chapter 87 um, and created a document which um, we then presented to the town meeting um, and then was reassessed um, 
to be a, uh, you'll have to help me out, Paul. Regulation. <laughs> Regulation, thank you. <laughs> um, so the big changes uh, in this proposal is essentially um, changing the, the definition of a tree that requires a tree hearing. Currently under Mass General Law Chapter 87, any tree that is 1.5 inches in caliper, which is measured, I believe, six inches off the ground, would require a tree hearing. Um, that's, that's a lot of work uh, for myself and for most people doing projects that affect the public way, for brushy roads, a regeneration that's taking place on the side of roads. I'd like, I'm proposing to change that to five inches um, so that any tree that is five inches in diameter at breast height, which is four and a half feet off the ground. Um, and that'll help us with managing the brush along the sides of the roads and things like that um, and simplify um, projects. What section is that in? Um, it's in section six, process to request a tree removal or pruning. Do you have the original draft that I gave you guys? I can give you copies. I think they have copies if this is the document. It's not dated or anything. Let's make sure it's the same thing. Um. Format is different. Speak into the microphone. You should be Sorry. on the microphone. So, um, so there's two. The, the uh, Master Law Chapter 7 you know, requires a tree hearing for trees 1.5 inches in caliper and up. What I'm proposing to do is that's still defined as a public shade tree. It just doesn't require a tree hearing. So uh, later on in the document, um, John, section six. Six. It would mention the five inch. Five inches is in section Would require a tree hearing. Um, the other significant change from Master Law Chapter 7 is um, placing a, a, a reasonable value on the tree itself. So if it's a healthy public shade tree, not a risk tree, a tree that is you know, dead, um, uh, those trees that are perfectly healthy and are expected to have a long life has a replacement value of $90 per inch DBH. Um, that's roughly what it costs to purchase a, a one-inch tree, what it comes down to. Um, then uh, also, we clearly define roles of the select board or council, um, tree warden, and the public shade tree committee. And then also to strengthen enforcement of the, uh, of the laws. And there's a little bit more about uh, specifying exactly what is a prohibited act with regard to shade trees and how the fines work and to make sure the fines go into the gift tree fund so that we can then purchase new trees. Yes. So one of the things we talked about before, and I know I saw it here someplace and now I'm seeing another reference, so I wonder, maybe there are multiple references. Um, is associated with the gift tree. I see that listed in item uh, G on page four. This is not page numbered, but okay, under, pay, under item six, under G, it has fees and it talks about the $90 per inch and it talks about the gift tree fund and it talks about fines, of course, in the fines section, but one of the things we talked about last time was fines gen go into the general fund. Fines don't go into the gift right. tree fund. So under and fines, so it's under 7C. It says all fines from A and B should go into the town's general, general fund. fund. Just to be sure we're clear that that's what everybody understands. Yes. Okay, good, because that separation was important before. The fines would not go to the gift tree fund. Right. They go to the general fund. Yeah, that's fine. I think on this right. draft, I didn't know that. And also, as uh, Mr. Bachman pointed out, um, the fine would be $300 because of some 
rather than 500. That, I forget the reasons that you explained that. So that was my question number two, which was that we had said in the town meeting article that in the absence of a regulation promulgated here under establishing a different amount, each such violation shall be subject to a fine of 300. And we talked about 300 at our meeting back on October 16th of 2017, but this says 500. So are we changing that to 300 or is somebody telling us that it can be 500 for some reason? We're changing it to 300. We're changing it to 300 even though the document we have in front of us yes. says 500, okay. So I have a slight suspicion that the document we had in our packet that we got may not be the newest copy. And the reason why I say that is there's a few places where um, word bylaw is used instead of regulation, um, and it still has the right. 500 in it. So I don't know, if your copy has 300 instead of 500, then we may need the copy that you have brought. No, mine also says 500. Okay. Although, given that we've gone from a town to a city, we may be able to actually go to $500 for the fine. Um, 300 is a limit on cities, uh, on towns, ironically enough, for fines. But I haven't looked at what the, what the fine limit is for cities. But anyway, Mr. Wall? We could leave that to, to the new town council to figure out because we don't want to tie their hands. Uh, just a minor point, since we're still editing the document, you know, I was thinking if someone is reading this, sometimes terms are not defined. So if I'm reading definitions on page one, you know, it talks about DBH diameter at breast height. And I'm wondering, what is that? I can intuit it. But if I turn to page two, I find the actual height listed um, as 4.5 feet in Roman numeral seven. You might want to move that to page one where the term is first introduced for the sake of clarity. Does that make sense? If you look at um, item 1B definitions, it mentions diameter at breast height. And I believe that's the first mention of the term, but it's not defined. Whereas if you turn to page two, item um, B, Roman numeral small seven, it identifies diameter at breast height as 4.5 feet off the ground. So I would just I maybe move that to page one for the sake of clarity. I think we were trying to put all the definitions in one place at that time. Right, but so. if yeah. you give the measurement, you define Agreed. it much better. Yeah. There's a minor typo also in G on page three, replaces versus replaced, but that's just a Scrivener's error. Questions? Mr. Seinberg. Yeah, this may be a question for Mr. Bachleman, though. Uh, so I might know the answer too. Uh, Section 8 appeals, uh, the last sentence is appeals will be heard by the select board. Has anybody done any research <laughs> to determine once a council is in place? whether the council hears appeals or whether there is some other mechanism that needs to be established? Um, I have not. I think we would ask the bylaw review committee that's going over all of our bylaws and things like this to analyze that. If they're going to be have control over the public way, then they would be... The so go to the council? If they're going to have control over the public way. So because this keeps coming up, I think that we should work under the assumption that while we're still a select board and while we're still a town, we have to do the things that we're not going to say or future council or future licensing authority in these things because that's just too confusing. It just needs to be what it is now. But I think it's worth maybe noting in our minutes each time. And here's another one <laughs> for the bylaw review committee, because it's one that may in fact come up before some other things do, even though they're not, they're doing actual bylaws rather than regulations. And this one still has the reference to bylaw on page yep. one Several that places. needs to be changed to regulation, at least that place, and as you in indicated, more than one place. Um, but it's not a bylaw, but we're still going to give it to them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> because right. whatever what they're finding out for the bylaws in terms of public way, for example, and how to change that over to council, this will be the same kind of thing. 
and could potentially be kind of packaged up. So just to that last point about sort of the word bylaws, I went through and sort of circled a few places where that's, in, and there's or, the word ordinance in one place, which uh, again would be replaced by regulation, I believe. Um, but I didn't know how my colleagues wanted to proceed, whether we wanted to um, edit and then make a motion to move it as amended, or do we want to do an edit and then vote on it with a little less discussion, perhaps, at the next meeting. Do you have a suggestion, Mr. Bachman? I, I would suggest that you submit your comments and we bring it back to you for final. Okay. We do a, a good proof on it and all, the, all that kind of things. Um, and let you, at your next meeting, you can have a final look at it if there are any changes. Yeah, I think. Um, There's no urgency, I don't think. There isn't. And um, part of what you know, I was hoping to get uh, out of this um, hearing was actually your opinion. And you know, you've been doing this um, for a while, and you've had multiple hearings from various other uh, things in town as your expertise and you know how we can make this hearing process for public agencies work better. So if you feel that we're weak here on something and you think we should strengthen it, then I would like to hear about that. I think the general sense I'm getting from what I've heard as comments is that the general process is fine. We're going to have some tidying up of language, mostly, and organizational things. I don't think I saw anything personally that, that I thought needed to be added or removed, necessarily. Um, and I don't know if my colleagues do or not, but what I will suggest to them is, um, you know, offer edits or suggestions and, and send them to me or to Mr. Bachman. Um, and we'll put a last edit through this and then we'll we'll bring us back at our next meeting, probably mostly in a pro forma sort of way to just vote on it at that point unless there's, as, as we see a final copy, if there's issues with it at that point. But if there are structural things, you know, more significant structural questions that come up about process that's within the regulation around appeals or fines or, or whatever, then, um, we can potentially work those out in, in advance of our meeting of, uh, which I think will be the 13th, but yes? So two things associated with that. One is I don't think this outlines what how a, an appeal would work, mm -hmm. it, which is potentially okay. We don't know yet, and we could work that out when the time came, but it doesn't say exactly how that process would work. And the, the other part of that is any resident or interested party is, are we using kind of legal reference there or are we don't we just mean anyone? <laughs> I mean, when it comes right down to it, or are we saying interested party in some legal term, in some, in, I mean, don't, don't we in fact just mean anyone? Or are we saying, what, how would we define an interested party? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure we're that, we're going to be that specific so can we change it to just anyone <laughs> appeal which, yeah. which sounds a little broad but um that's fine i mean a lot of the language we took based on other towns bylaws that we were right. cutting and pasting and working with molly freilicker from the state dcr <laughs> urban forestry program and so some of the language yeah we weren't that comfortable <clears throat> with but it just seemed like that was the language was used so if you have better language great I think our main point is that what we wrote in this was, you know, the basic framework and points that we wanted to have covered and um, how it's finally, the fine print um, we're not so interested in. Yeah. Yes. So until you made your suggestion, I was going to recommend that you guys just edit this and be done with it. Okay. I, I don't feel the need to see it again. I'd like it to have page numbers, and I'd yep. like it to not have the references, and I'd like it to, uh, to the wrong kind of reg, which, again, I understand the cut and paste completely. That's how you learn, is you just take other people's stuff that they've already worked on. That's great. Um, that's a good way to, to form a framework. Um, and I appreciate your explanation that this is largely what you're already doing anyway, and it's putting it into a regulation. So page numbers, a date. And we could say, we could say as amended, you know, 
understanding that it's going to be fixed and then it would have today's date on it does that work because I, I personally don't want to read it again to see if there are more typos in it. I mean, I, it's, it's I important to me that we got the concepts right, and so. Yeah, except that I feel as a question um, of sort of process, a little bit uncomfortable adopting regulation and not be a, us adopting the regulation, actually voting on the regulation that's being adopted. So I do think it has to come back to us. Um, just for that purpose, it would be, be helpful, however, if we got two versions in the next round, one that shows the changes from what we're looking at right like now and then the final, then it's easier to do. I will take that on if that's advisable. And then... <clears throat> I think I think I'm, I agree with Mr. Steinberg. I think we should actually have the sort of polished version to vote on. Even I don't think we need to have a lengthy discussion, but unless we do it via email through redline versions. But does anyone else have a stronger preference to vote tonight on it and instead of a couple weeks from now? I I don't. See, we hardly ever do regulations. It's not like we're breaking with precedent. We just approved them a theory of a two-week trial of just like a made-up thing that was just given to us verbally and had no problem doing that. So I, I would just like to be able to move along, and I know that we don't have as many meetings, and if one person wants to take this on, I'm totally happy with that, and if Mr. Steinberg wants to be the one to do it, I'm fine with what the regulations say with the change to 300. I mean, it's got typos in it, so those will be fixed, meaning the references to bylaws will be changed. And you know we'll move the definition so it sounds nicer. The only substantive change is the 500 to 300, and I'm fine with that. I don't want us to be wordsmithing it again next time. Mr. Walls, any thoughts? I don't, don't have a real strong feeling. I mean, sometimes we're very fussy whether everything lists an address and a parcel and a name and a this and a that, and then here we're saying whatever. So. Um, I mean, I would. I think my instinct would be to maybe have a look at it, but not spend a lot of time in discussion. But I'm happy with the, to do whatever the majority wants. You know, I mean, I think just given that we are somewhat process oriented, it we wouldn't hurt. Again, until the 13th. Right, but there's no urgency, we're told. So, again, I don't. We've got plenty to do with our time, but I'm happy to go through and do the editing. So why don't I do that and circulate it, and then fairly soon. Um, the red line version, as Mr. Steinberg talked about. Mm -hmm. I'll give myself a deadline of the end of the week. That way it will give you plenty of time, which would be the 26th, I want to say. So that we'll be ready to vote on the 13th? Yeah. Evaluation things and other things we're doing? Recognize the members of the shade tree. So we, yes. Yeah, can I request that you send uh, Alan and the committee a copy before the final version is done? Absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. Are there also, I, I get the feeling that there are other members of the Shade Tree Committee here. Are there, yes. Did you want to? Would you like me of, to introduce them? Yes, or? please. Everybody? <laughs> you can just well, You could just name list them all. their names. I can do it from here. So <laughs> the camera shows uh, we have them. Shoshana King, who's um, joined the committee but is waiting for official authorization with the new town council. Um, next to her is Rachel uh, Luffler, who is a member, Nani Burak, uh, Becky, uh, um, Becky Mar Margulis is um, uh, not an official member, but she takes our minutes and has helped out a lot. And then the front row is Nancy, um, boy, my brain is not working at all. Um, we put you on the spot. Nancy Higgins, who's been on the committee for a while. So. Well, thank you all for the work on this, and, and like I said, we'll, we'll tidy it up a little bit and, and vote on it in our next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Next on our agenda is the proposed South Deerfield Water Treatment Intermunicipal Inter Agreement. And so, Mr. Mooring, if you would come up and share with us what you know about that at this point. The memo. There it is. So let me so at our last meeting, um, we, you approved a list of um, 
intermunicipal agreements. This is one I had highlighted as as potentially coming when and has come forward. Uh, we don't have the actual language of the agreement yet because it's still at town council. We anticipated getting it today, but we have not received it today. So Mr. Morning can give a little more background on why this is before you. So uh, the town of <clears throat> South Deerfield, actually, the town of South Deerfield has two water districts. The South Deerfield Water Supply District, which is in the southern part of the town, is having some uh, manning issues. They have not been able to find enough people to come in and fill the required manning. They're um, being scrutinized by DEP for their failure to have that. They are working diligently on it. They, um, they actually have advertisements out again for the two people they need to hire. But in the interim, they need a backup. So I reached out and said, look, if you're willing, we can talk about it and we can set up something where if you have a vacation or illness or something, we can provide the backup to you with one of our personnel. And then you just pay us and reimburse us for our costs for coming over there. Um, so the district is in agreement that they'd like to have us as a backup. They don't see us as becoming the new South Deerfield Water District people. Um, this is just a temporary thing for them to get their uh, manning situation taken care of and uh, take care of their issues with DEP. Um, this is something, um, it's not something that needs to be approved tonight, but we do need to make sure that, uh, we do need to say we're willing to do it and <clears throat> um, commit to helping them tonight. Otherwise, they need to find something else. DEP is holding their feet to a pretty quick timeline to get into, bring everything back into compliance with their manning. So that's where they are, um, and we actually, uh, so we did actually offer to help, and then. It's predominantly a staffing issue for them as far as you have people with the appropriate certifications and skills, they have a shortage in that, and you need, they need coverage for certain days a week, times of day, that sort of thing, and. Yes. Okay. Ms. Brewer. The memo says water supply district. Is that the more accurate reference than South Deerfield water treatment that's listed in our map? motion yes it's the wa south, south deerfield, deerfield water, water supply mm -hmm. district. district like they have their own acronym they do <laughs> the two s's throw you off too it's like what south deerfield water oh so do we have other questions concerns are we ready for a motion <laughs> well I do have a concern, but uh, and that is that uh, we not get into a situation where we are providing so much staffing for another district that it's affecting the operations of our own water system. But uh, I'm assuming that the town manager and the uh, superintendent and the public works are attentive to that and uh, will protect our water supply system. Yes, we've looked into that and we've already figured out how we can do this to make sure we don't come up short. If there's any need for overtime, it'll be the overtime will be performed on South Deerfield side, so the op operators will be on overtime on their side, and we won't have to pay extra to meet the needs of doing this. Um, we do have a couple people, some seasonal people in because it's the summer, and they'll be able to cover some of our staffing issues on our side because of the fact that we have more actual operators that are licensed than. South Deerfield does. Well, I'll make the motion and note that in doing so that, oh, I'm sorry. I wonder if you might include in the motion to say as described in the memo of July 19th, because this is more information than we had on the other agreements and does give a pretty good picture, I think, of what the plan is. And so referencing that memo would enable me to vote for it. Um, okay, I can do that, and uh, what I was going to note is that uh, this really is an authorization for the town manager, so the town manager ultimately decides it's an inappropriate action, uh, but it, uh, he can act accordingly. But it also gives us the ability to continue the conversations with South Deerfield, which is apparently what is really most needed right now. So move to authorize town manager to enter into the
the intermunicipal agreement with South Deerfield Water Supply District as described in the memo of July 19, 2018. So motion and a second to further discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? So that's unanimous with one absent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to suggest is we do the next item and then we take a short break before we get into our, the, the other parts of, of Section 4. So next item is Transportation Fund Additional Appropriation Options. First look, and the reason for this on our agenda is we haven't had a, a real conversation yet about the additional um, appropriation of transportation funds for uh, potential support of the PVTA. Um, I looked rather quickly at the budget that the conference budget that was put together and approved, I want to say last Friday, is that, is mm -hmm. that right? I think it was last Friday. Um, at the uh, state contract assistance for the RTAs is the lingo. Um, and it was at the Senate's uh, appropriation level of 88 million, which is in keeping with uh, what was originally sort of promised several years ago. Uh, that would, if it survives signage by the governor, uh, which he has line item vetoed, so he may reduce that number, but if it survives, then, then um, the need for us to uh, use this appropriation for the transportation fund to support routes would, would not be there because it would be uh, entirely likely that the routes would stay in, in, in the forms that they are now. The complicating factor is if, if is if we choose to use uh, that additional funding for uh, supportive routes, uh, the difficulty we run into is uh, in the past when we, uh, let me state it this way, in the past when we've had this circumstance, we've wholesale purchased a route. And that's a much different circumstance than, in other words, we're buying a service. In this circumstance, uh, we, you know, the amount we have doesn't purchase a route per se. It would buy portions of a route. And the difficulty is there's an interdependency between um, both the north and the south as far as equity questions, uh, and even within routes. So there's some some question within a, uh, you know, the the. Uh, so for example, let me just put it this way: um, if we were to uh, continue support of routes for Saturday evenings on a loop that goes around campus, which is one of the suggestions. That is something that we could do and, and would be less than the amount that's available to us. But most other changes that involve additional uh, frequency of routes um, and that sort of thing involve uh, a much, much more complicated uh, series of factors. So there's an analysis that has to get done relative to, to uh, Title VI and that also involves, you know, support of routes in the southern half of the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority uh, District. So, for example, if we provide greater route coverage here, then there has to be a corresponding thing there. Um, I'm oversimplifying in a lot of ways here, but but just to try to indicate the the complexities of uh, disproportionate and disparate impact, which are are both under the Title VI. They were looking for uh, people of different economic means and also different identified groups being disproportionately uh, affected. Um, and so it, it's, it's a complicated circumstance. I think the example, you know, um, Mr. Bachman and I were talking about this. He, he gave an example of, you know, there are times in, in school districts where someone will say, oh, someone of means will say, oh, I want, you know, Russian to be offered at our high school. I'll just, you know, essentially buy a teacher to teach this class. And it, it, it while in some ways that is the cost of, of, say, a class, it's not quite that way because of the complications of scheduling and interlacing it with all the other things that go on within the budget of a, of a school district, for example. Um, this is kind of a similar circumstance. I do think there are some potential things we could do relative to this additional appropriation. Um, so the rates uh, for, for the buses, which largely don't affect us but in some ways do, um, particularly around uh, senior service, senior van service, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and what they call paratransit service. Those rates went up July 1st, and that those rate increases will be in effect. Um, so there's some additional costs that people will be taking on uh, in in those circumstances. 
We have traditionally in our senior center offered a 10 pack of, of tickets uh, with a 50 cent per ticket discount. Um, that was, you know, so that made $2.50 tickets now $2. Um, the ticket that was two fifty is now three dollars, and so potentially we could offer a suggestion to the manager that that a different or an additional discount could be applied uh, to those um, to those ticket packages that people buy. Um, there's also one of the other significant changes is that for uh, van service like that, if you are outside of a three quarter mile radius of a stop. There's an additional charge. In the past, that has not been charged. PBTA did not charge for picking up people outside that three-quarter mile radius. Um, and so, if you if you live outside a three-quarter mile radius, you will be incurring a cost you didn't incur before. Um, we could also potentially find a way to potentially support uh, folks with regard to to mitigating that uh, new cost that that would be coming to them as a result of that. I don't know offhand how many people are affected by either one of those. Um, but just wanted to sort of paint that picture a little bit. Um, but I do think it was encouraging to see that the, that the uh, compromise or the, uh, yeah, the uh, compromise budget that the House and Senate came together funded the RTAs at, at the level that would, would in a sense make uh, PVTA whole. So I don't know if anybody had any questions or suggestions or other things they wanted to bring up relative to this or concerns or feedback they've heard from the community or anything. You both have a, something to say. But. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I have a general question. That is, uh, town meeting voted the money uh, to be available to the town manager to spend um, in order to achieve. With the, they had a stated version. It wasn't legally binding, but it was what their <coughs> stated intent was. Um, do we, if, if the stated intent is not necessary as the appropriate decision not to spend the money at all, uh, being, uh, never quite being able to put my finance side of me away, we did fund it out of the uh, limited amount of reserves for the Transportation Enterprise Fund, which is a non-recurring amount of money which is what bothered me about the whole proposal to begin with. Um, and uh, uh, given the stresses that we have on our parking system and the infrastructure needs of our parking system, uh, I'm not sure that it's necessarily the best thing to do. I think that that's a decision that, however, the town manager needs to make. Mr. Wall. I appreciate that advice because I think all of us had this feeling when things are proposed that sound good and do something heartwarming we all approve of and we're aware of the complications that will ensue and it puts us in a difficult position and I suppose the town manager as well but we trust his discretion. Just to, to respond to what the chair said about these possible solutions I, mean, I recall from the general conversations we had and I think previous agenda setting too that the bottom line is it's very difficult just to add routes the way that people think we can for all the reasons that you've mentioned and probably some others too. And I appreciated your attempt in past weeks to think of these alternatives such as subsidizing the tickets or these uh, van access that would affect certainly our residents and not complicate the system as a whole. So I'm, I, I find that encouraging. So just to offer, you know, I, I mostly sort of painted these pictures of things we could do, not necessarily say. I wanted to, <laughs> um, but it, you know, I, I think it's encouraging the the House and Senate have sort of stepped up to fund at a, a higher level, which is what they should have done all along. But, but, um, but I, you know, I agree with Mr. Steinberg. I think that we we recognize it's a it was a non recurring source of revenue, and and we do have some other needs. There's going to be a fairly extensive project on the North Pond <laughs> that will involve using those uh, transportation fund monies to help get that project done. And, and so, you know, not spending it would be probably the wisest choice if possible. Did you have anything to offer? No, no I, I agree. I mean, I think the, the town meeting action was pretty directive. Um, and while it is within the purview to expand that, 
my sense was we had I had recommended and I think the select board had recommended against spending the money at all so if the the funding level continues at the way the house and the senate has uh, proposed then my instinct would be not to spend it on something that we think the town meeting might have thought about it didn't even come up at town meeting so and since it was our intent my intent or and I think the select board's intent was that this is money that should not be allocated this way in the first place that would solve the problem in a way well well just I mean to amplify that and the circumstances that prompted the motion in the first place no longer exist apparently or will be confirmed so I think we're entirely within our rights and not violating any trust implied or or other if we decide not to spend the money all right yes Ms. Brewer. so after the governor signs it and it actually happens and there's always those little pieces um, then it seems like we should have a memo from the manager that says but not yet. Don't yeah, yeah. wait till he signs it, and that says, under this town meeting, under the budget article, we did the the enterprise article. We did this. We're not going to spend it. And then it's like, there we have it. In case somebody asks in the future, what did you ever do with that? We have a thing to pull out in addition to just saying it. Thank you. So I wanted to put that. So we kind of touched on a little bit over over the ensuing weeks since town meeting ended but we hadn't formally put it on the agenda so I wanted to put it on the agenda and then of course they finished the budget last Friday after we set the agenda so it in a lot of ways helped us in that regard um, so we may not bring this up again other than to have a memo from, from the manager so why don't we take a, a short break uh, before we get into the next item on our agenda and I'll make a note and uh, we'll get into that so we'll take a short break. Do we have to do our reading during this break too, or is that going to be a separate break? <laughs> That'll be a separate break. I okay. Think. So next in our agenda, <clears throat> we're under the uh, town manager performance review. Um, We'll start first with a summary of his uh, self-evaluation, which was in our packet, I believe. So, if Mr. Yeah. Bachman, if you want to so, take us through that a little so bit. So, that's a long document, and what I intend to do tonight is just talk to you about the big things, the big picture things, and the medium picture things, and then the things that haven't been done yet that uh, probably make a, it'll make a lot more sense than reading all the details. The memo tracks the language of the goals that were established. But I want to talk more sort of cons the, um, topically for you. So. Um, of the big picture things I think we accomplished, and I, note, I want to note that all these things were accomplished not by me, but um, working with a, a very talented team of staff and also great leadership by the select board because all of these things have been in uh, conversation with the select board and making sure we're all on the same page before we move forward. So the biggest one I think is our uh, health insurance. The fact that we had identified a problem with our self-insurance program, uh, that uh, our, self, our health insurance is our largest uh, benefit program that we offer to our employees. It's a major cost item in the budget and was, uh, has been uh, really infringing on any new developments that we could produce into the budget. Um, Working with staff, um, we were able to conceive a path, identify the problem, conceive a path forward, um, work with our union representatives to come to a, a agreed upon solution, and then had a, a very good implementation process. So that's, that would be the number one thing. I think the second thing was um, the creating the tax incentive for the Beacon Project, which I think is um, was a major initiative for the town building on a bylaw that the town meeting had approved um, and working through the details of that was very time consuming working with the assistant town manager and the principal assessor specifically um, and then again working through the select board and, and getting the um, overall mission on what we wanted to accomplish as a town was critical to that so that would be the second big big thing that I think we accomplished the third big thing was uh, getting through the negotiation and coming to a 10-year contract with for our, with Amherst media for our peg contract 
Uh, fourth thing was um, finally getting the fire study, fire staffing study completed and delivered and presented to the board and to the uh, working it through the, the union and the fire and the staff at the fire department. Now that study has been offset a little bit because of the decision by the town of Hadley to take its ambulance services uh, to a private company, but the value of that um, study has impacted our negotiations with the union and we we actually have some good language in there so that when the staffing decisions need to be made uh, we can follow the guidance guidance of this study um, speaking of ambulance moving the ambulance from a staffed ambulance billing from a staff position in town hall to a third party billing system which um, while it eliminated a position in town hall it didn't have that person lose their job we were able to manage that at a, in a by doing that in a timely manner so that the person who was doing that was able to um, transfer into an, an equally good position and she's very happy in her new position so that saves us a position in town hall and we think that moving the ambulance billing to a third party billing system will create greater efficiencies and, and increase our collections um, the marijuana, everything about marijuana, um, the host community agreements, the recreational, the bylaws, I was not very, not as involved in that as our select board members and our senior staff have been, especially our economic development director, but that was an enormous effort by a large group of people and had success moving in that direction. Um, continuing outreach uh, through the Cup of Joe, the meetup with the town employees, um, press releases, newsletters, doing the road show, um, implementing written reports to the select board on a, a monthly basis. I think we're all good steps taken to continue to do outreach uh, and to better inform the public about the amazing things that are being, that are happening in town government. Um, the, uh, the LSSC re reorganization um, has provided us with, again, cost savings in terms of a position, eliminating some positions, but also adding uh, experienced, high quality staff into key positions there. And um, moving forward and making it a priority f uh, for major capital investment on roads and sidewalks. Um, moving forward on the North Common project, moving forward on Groff Park, and moving forward on wayf wayfinding signs. Those are all significant projects that you're seeing tangible uh, advances on. You'll see a lot more in, in the coming months. And the um, and then the sort of key things that happen all the time, which is um, providing adequate support to the board. Um, Managing the budget, you know, we, just as a note, the North, while we had that, you know about the f uh, failure of the boiler in the North Amherst Fire Station, um, the fire department did tremendous work with the, under the guidance of the comptroller to manage their budget, so we were able to cover that expense from within the fire department's budget instead of needing a, tr a, a transfer or a special appropriation from town meeting. Um, and then working with employees and specifically really proud of our new hires for town clerk and executive assistant, assistant to the town manager, two very strong hires that I think are really poised, for, uh, helps us be poised to move into the, um, the coming years with, under the new form of government. Um, the, the sort of, that's the big picture item, the medium picture items I'd say are the work that we've done under our economic development, getting our economic development plan um, complete it and or nearly complete it um, and becoming a community compact cabinet which was one of the things that I think the town had said that we should become um, adopting having the board adopt the property disposition policy and moving that forward as we as we go forward um, working on the zero energy for municipal buildings um, bylaw which was adjusted to make it more palatable and achievable and helping us to possibly achieve the goals of the bylaw um, ensuring that the presidential apartments maintain their affordability and um, and then having um, expanding our ability for our town staff to be involved on policy committees at the Mass Municipal Association specifically 
uh, the economic development director and superintendent of public works, and um, I've been appointed to the Mass Municipal Management Association Board of Directors as well. Um, what, what things are out there that we still need to work on? There's a lot, there always is a lot. Um, one of them is the um, capital projects. I think that's gonna be a major topic. We have a lot of capital projects. We have a lot of capital needs that we move, need to move forward on putting together a finance plan so that people can say, yes, I see how we can afford it. And I see have a, we have a plan in place to address it. Um, along those models, along those lines, is there are vacancies that I need to fill, specifically the treasurer collector's position and the finance director's position. Those are two hyper key positions that are, next, are teed up to be the next ones to be hired. Um, Working on the regional assessment model with the schools will take a, a fair amount of time, I think, in the coming uh, months. Um, making sure our bond rating is as strong as possible as we move into the world of borrowing money for major capital projects. Uh, Re-envisioning our relationships with the, with the university specifically through UTAC, but also um, in enhancing our relationships with the two colleges. Um, and addressing the, the needs for water supply and resiliency of our water supply uh, system and a lot of um, environmental issues that are, that are out there. And then the last thing I want to mention is, of course, the implementation of a new form of government that will take an enormous amount of time, I think, for all of us, and um, it'll be a real adventure to figure out how to make, make this new form of government work. I think there's a lot of excitement about it, and so, and I'm looking forward to that. So those are sort of the big picture, the medium picture, and then the things that need work or you can anticipate we'll be do doing work on as you start to think about goals for next year. So that's a short summary of that 12 page document. Thank you for that. Are there questions for the manager relative to his self-evaluation or the report he just gave us? None are required. Yeah. <laughs> that happened the other night, right? So since, since we, the next step in the process involves us writing what we think. Right. Yes. Feel free to make us a copy of your notes. I can summarize it. I'm yeah. scribbling frantically. Wait, is that on page three or page eight? Or, but thank you for, for summarizing it that way. But also this is, in fact, our opportunity to have read this ahead of time and ask questions as in, we didn't think that's what we meant when we wrote the goal because we've run into that problem before and then we go to fill out the evaluation and we realize, oh wait, you answered, the, or a previous town manager, answered a different question than what we thought we had <coughs> asked. And so that's one of the reasons we ask you to get this to us ahead of time and you did get it to us ahead of time despite other stressors in life and so we really appreciate that and you had emailed it to us much earlier and so it's only our own fault if we don't have proper questions to ask now because this is our only opportunity to do so effectively in a group to check in with each other and say is this what we meant when we said this um, before we write our evaluations because after that it'll be in the evaluation so Speak now. <laughs> That's right. Make sure you're clear on what you wanted. Thank you for not being depressed at the dense print on these three pages of gold. <laughs> this is really, we are really something to behold. No, I was just. Discussing. But we have to fill out the evaluation form, so, you know, that's our penalty. That's right. I do think in, in, as we think about, uh, and this gets into some topics we'll talk about a little bit more later, I do think a potential piece of advice I would give to the incoming council would be to separate goals from standards of practice. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got it a little blended here, but we can discuss that in more detail another time, but, but nonetheless, um, we do have several goals in here that are, you know, that have some specific actual items that you've taken action on, which is fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, are there other questions or comments for the manager? Yes. Assuming that we aren't going to have any other discussion about the evaluation tonight, 
I wanted to revisit the calendar because we're still the only thing I was going to. <laughs> good because I show we're still showing the 27th instead of the 24th. And so what did we decide? Did I, about? I thought that I had put it in as the 24th slash fifth. They, they oh, on the back captured it. Oh, yeah. on the back of this. So are we comfortable now with canceling the 27th? I think we're going to need to well two of the members we're gonna are not two gonna members not here anyway and so unless there was some create and we said you know unless there were some licenses we really had to do or something which three of us could do but we didn't want to do any eval stuff so does that mean we're gonna leave it on there um just in case or do we um, I, i'd prefer to cancel it from the standpoint that that way we don't try and put anything on it and if we need something really desperately before then we can potentially call a meeting or right. add it into, like if we have to do one license, I mean, we can just do it. Day or do it. Like yeah. Well, we, we, the, the, so we discussed a, a meeting on the 24th, and I forget if we took a motion relative to that or not, but it was, a, is, I think, an discussed it more than once. It was 8 a.m. if. Yeah, it was, it was early. Mm -hmm. um, I have written down 8 o'clock to substitute for 827. Right, right. So that was. So is that yeah. added to the vision? So we, I don't know that we formally took a vote to make the 20th or if we just all marked it on our calendars with the expectation we would. I think you were going to talk about it again, was my understanding. Right. So I think, yeah, I think people were going to review their, their calendars one last time. Just to make sure that time. everybody could really do Friday the 24th because so the 24th then there's no point in fixing it. If right. We can't all be there Friday right. the 24th. But we can all be there Friday the 24th, as I understood. I can. Okay, so we can, and then... So we could move to change the meeting of Monday, August 27th to Friday, August 24th, or however you would prefer to phrase that, but meaning that we would not meet on August 27th, and we would meet Friday the 24th at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then there was also an alternate date if something, the sub there was an, was that an additional day? So if we need more time for, to finish up the review, we've got right. the 5th of September, which is a Wednesday. After which is the, a Wednesday. So we would just continue. And that's that. on our list. That yes. is already on our list. Okay. But just in terms of our process, in terms of that calendar we have that shows us which date we're doing different things um, for the evaluation, it includes the 5th now. Sounds okay. like. So that, that was a motion to change the meeting of 827 to 824 at 8 a.m.? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous with one absent. Would you please send us out a revised timeline? A revised timeline that reflects that, that timeline document that we just right. keep tweaking as we go along? Right. Um, just email it to us at some point. Yeah, I think I sent it. Uh, I could pull off the 27th. I don't know the 27th is on there. I think I actually last version. I think may we have may have changed it. I may have pulled that out. We'll just take a look at it maybe. And yes. Okay. Let me put that on my, my to-do list here. Okay. Um, so if there's not other, other discussion about the, the manager's uh, self-evaluation, um, I did want to bring up the topic of the fiscal year 19 goals. And, and, and of course, given this year is a much different circumstance given the change in government, I think how we shape those or what we want to do relative to goal setting uh, Is very different so I wanted to bring that as a topic usually we have you know when we get into this meeting in the summer we start talking about sort of you know itemizing the kinds of things relative to the fiscal 18 goals which are we keeping which are we getting away from which new things we want to do but I think given the change of government it's a much different circumstance the council is going to create their own list of things they want the manager to to, to take on and and so um, I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about how we might approach um, that you know, one approach is to do nothing and not give many goals and just sort of give them advice as we go along. Or we could uh, create very short-term goals that are very you know specific, probably much around the transition. I, I'm curious what you think. 
So I, I appreciate you bringing this up to us as being, let's consider doing something different because we did talk about that for the evaluation itself, you know, how, and really how many hours do we want to spend on that at this point, given how many we already spend. And so um, the goals sometimes sort of float away from us too in terms of how busy our agendas get and moving forward. So maybe making some concrete decisions after discussion tonight or if we need to have it again another night I think would be helpful. I think that the goals, I think we should not pretend that the FY18 goals go away. I think that there might be some way of saying, for example, and this may reflect what you were referring to earlier, Mr. Slaughter, about, um, sorry, I don't have it in front of me here, but uh, Standards, versus, standards goals. versus goals, exactly. And so things like regular communication to the select board. So that's something that a future council is probably going to want to evaluate the town manager on. But so rather than just saying, well, you can't see this, <laughs> you know, this was from the select board, this isn't yours. Um, I think we could easily put like a cover letter on something like this or on our evaluation or I mean I'm open to suggestion obviously but that says these are the three things let's imagine we could get it to three these are the three things they'll each be two pages long that um, we think the town manager is going to focus on between now and the transition maybe they're all transition things um, and these were his goals before and we still think they're pretty good goals, and you can look at our evaluation to see which things are done. But rather than even having to try and go through and say, well, I think we finished 5E or something like, let's just not even bother. I think putting a cover on that says, this is what we evaluated and based on, here's the evaluation, and here's what we're asking him to do for this next period of time. And then you guys figure out your own timeline working with him as to what he wants to do. Because I don't think we're going to evaluate him again before the end and so I think it's just direction you know just right. just generally here's what we would we would hope you might spend some time telling us about over the next few months um, setting up that kind of expectation rather than like some mini evaluation before it's done or anything like that or rather than just dropping it all together I mean I think it makes sense we we've, we've had a couple of retreats talking about the kinds of things we kind of having the short, medium, and long term to work on and coming up with what some of those things are that we think are the really short term things. And we can even say, we know this can't be worked on right now, but we know that you'll want to work on this other stuff in the future. Maybe this is part of that whole, you know, letter to the future council concept. Ms. Paul? I think that makes sense. And just you know, for the benefit of the viewing audience, too, I think it's the chair's remark about, uh, I forget how you put it, about goals versus standards. Um, we've, over the years, made some progress in that because we used to have things that basically asked the, the town manager not to be a crook and a cheat, you know, <laughs> which is obvious. <laughs> Other hand, you know, Let that help. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> cut you some slack there. But, you know, some things like con communicating about the select board on one level should be just as obvious as that. That's what you do, but we've found that that's not always the case or certain things bear repeating. So, you know, one thing we might want to think about is how we would articulate that, you know, just sort of a checklist uh, for people, especially for the town council coming in that's not familiar with how these things work. Uh, and as the town manager in his evaluation mentioned too, that communication has to be within the bounds of the open meeting law and so forth. Um, something that occurred to me, that always occurs to me in the evaluations, as you'll probably find out in a couple of weeks, is that some of these things, um, I think it's a little bit like what the chair was saying, don't differentiate between things that are under the town manager's control versus things that are not. So for example, I'm glad we have lots of CPA money, but it's, what he does has nothing to do with that. Um, so it, it's part of the town's fiscal health and it shows where we can expend money, but it's not something we can evaluate in the sense of saying this was done well or done badly because it's not even in his purview. Um, I also appreciated the town manager's remarks here uh, not just the summary of the self-evaluation, but the looking forward, you know, things remain to be done. For example, the critical need to pay attention to questions of debt and fiscal stability as capital projects come online. So I think if we could take some of that and, you know, provide some guidelines there, that'd be very useful, I would imagine, for the council. You know, to say that this is what the town manager sees as critical issues going forward the next year or quarter or half year, and that we agree with those, I don't know, for what it's worth. So there are a number of, sort of very specific um, 
goals that really have been continued year for year and they really speak to the town's needs and uh, I don't think that they're going to go away um, as the select board goes away. Uh, I think that they really are expectations of the town and uh, I suspect that uh, there are things that Mr. Balcomen would work on regardless. But um, we do um, know that there are a number of projects like um, continuing to work on our relationships with the university and the two colleges. It's worth stating, but it's not, it sort of falls into that category. Uh, so I, I th I, it's worth con continuing. It's simply because it's a document we've been at for so many years and uh, we should be handing it over to the new body and letting the new body um, work with the town manager to modify it as needed. But I think that we have articulated them with the guidance of town meeting over a number of years. So I think what would be helpful is sort of a two-part document. One is this sort of blends into the next agenda item, actually, is which is... Uh, topics for a future council consideration. One would be what you see as the major challenges and goals that you think the town manager should be working on and what are some tangible outcomes that you'd like to see. Now, these things might not come to fruition during the term of the select board, but would extend into the term of the, the beginning term of the council, it, but something that they could modify. But the, 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 the items of discussion are going to be, the, they're probably pretty common and it'd be helpful for the new council to say, well, here's what this learned body has thought are the highest priority things that need attention. And then the second part of it would be, I think part of this thing is what makes for a good, you know, board manager relations. And that sort of gets more to the standards, I think, that the chair talked about. And like, what are those things? And this sort of gets into what 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 are the things that from your experience made for a good relationship and you know it might be on the communication or whatever it is levels um and a sort of a second phase that might be that type of uh, memo to me but also to the future council i think if you if we start to think about it in terms of who the audience for the whatever it is you put together is being both the manager and the future council i think it actually will be a more a richer document because and then the council can say, "Wow, they didn't know anything." They were, there. but I think the council isn't going to say that. They're going to say, "Thank you for pre-thinking this for us, so that we have something to react to." So I think that's a, that will be a that'll be a document. I think if if it's able to be produced by the board over the next couple months, that the council will go back to over time and say, "Ah, now I understand why they said this," and it won't be just something that they look at in the first meeting and say, "Huh, interesting," but I think it's going to be something that month after month as they start to learn about the town and how they're functioning they're going to come back to this and say oh this is what a matured body had come to as being the highest priorities this is what a matured body of, of the select board has come to say as being the uh, values and sort of things that matter and I think that's sort of the hardest thing a lot of times is for a new board is to figure out what matters what do, do I care a lot about this process or that process or do I care a little about it and I think providing guidance from your seats is really important for, for the incoming council and would also be provide good guidance for me so so I think I've, I've got some sense of that I, I like sort of what people have offered as, as suggestions for this um, and just to in some ways skip ahead to the the charter transition and so we've had a because I think that naturally flows from from what the manager was just saying so we've we've talked about a few topics for future council consideration and and in a couple different ways we talked about it as in concrete things like oh you know fire station and other capital projects but we've also talked in more general terms um, about things like well how do you want to handle you know the format of your regulation and how you structure those and where we've struggled or not struggled and parking and you know whatever it is and so I think what I was thinking about, and part of why I put the agenda I know of how to do work of, of gathering, storing, and sharing it, you know, is, is partly the idea behind that is that we need to start, I think, memorializing in actual, like, ink and paper <laughs> what some of these topics are. We've kind of tossed a few out over the last several months. We need to 
I think, review our minutes in some ways and pluck those out, but then also think about how we might shape, um, you know, articulating what we mean by those things. And some of that is to your point about what makes for a good board manager relationship, what are the major challenges and goals coming forward. I think there are other things that aren't in those two categories but still fall within this sort of, um, you know, legacy documents for lack of a term to kind of prepare the council to do work but also to um, you know frame their thinking a little bit not to to con constrain them too much because they get to do what they choose to do but at the same time you know as you said sort of use our experience um, and know where where uh, we've run into difficulties and and you know give them some guidance relative to how to potentially find the most expedient path around some things. I mean, some things are going to just take time because they just do. Um, but things they'll want to do, and some of them are simple things like, well, let's number the pages, let's state all the things, let's, you know, whatever those things. I mean, sometimes it's very pragmatic advice like that. It seems silly, but it really is useful um, because it helps people keep their versions straight and, and those sort of, you know, nuts and bolts sort of things. But I do think we need to start sort of compiling that and then segregating it to sort of, uh, bits of work to, to potentially try to chip away at a little bit in, in some respects. Um, but I wanted people's opinions about that idea of, of trying to gather that and, and start to produce these kinds of things. I mean, there's more immediate concerns relative to guidance for the manager in, in the next few months as we finish out our terms, but also um, for him and for the council as they move forward. Mr. Simon? There is going to be a significant difference and the council is going to have to work that out with Mr. Bauckham and, and that is that how a five-person board relates to the manager is going to be different than how a 13-person board or council relates to the manager. There, there will need to be different mechanics um, of how that happens and uh, so I don't know that we can take our experience and automatically transfer it because it is such a different body just because of its size also because it covers both the wider and a different range of functions uh, it's not going to have to deal with uh, one day liquor licenses uh, or liquor licenses at all, on the other hand, that's going to be dealing with zoning. I think there are certainly things we've struggled with with just five of us that we can warn them that, hey, when you double the group or almost triple the group, it's going to be even more difficult. I mean, uh, that's one of the things I think about, but I agree that, that a 13-person uh, board is going to have to function very differently because it of just the numbers that are involved. Ms. Brewer. Right, and like you said, I mean, I, maybe I do want to write several pages about local licensing authority, but that would be for the you know, licensing commission, so it's more of a directing the town manager. Remember all these things we were frustrated by every time we looked at this, or we didn't, we knew we never got to, just because we never got to. And so that part's not to the council per se, but because it's the town manager that appoints the local licensing authority, but the licensing commission. But that's still, I think we, we don't need to just forget about it because we learned a lot when we had to have an actual hearing, for example, um, with a problem. And so even though we have to go back a little bit to try and remind ourselves, the people who are gonna be on it are literally people who've never done that hearing. We can guarantee that, <laughs> so because they weren't <laughs> these five people, so it's um, that we'll have to do that in the future. And so I think that'd be useful, as well. Even though, and you know, and to be fair with zoning, I mean, we do talk about zoning, but of course we didn't get to make the decision. It just like there'll still be a planning board, but um, but this body of thirteen will have the pleasure, as opposed to the five of us talking about it before town meeting. We talked about this a little bit before in terms of, I'm just trying to think of like practically speaking how this even works for five of us to, to come up with this document. So if it was going to be something like a Google document, which we've toyed with before and has never really worked out great for us, if we somehow made it publicly visible, although not publicly editable, 
Um, I think that would prevent anything from seeming like it was an opinion per se. I mean, saying we need to we need to discuss these three items about lunch cart licensing doesn't feel like as much of an opinion during a transition period like this. But there is always the concern associated with open meeting law. If we just keep publishing lists and then we're just going to keep having to write on them and somebody's going to have to update them and then it's just like I'm not sure that's really effective. I mean, I was thinking literally of a clipboard at one point. Do we have a clipboard that we start writing things on while we're here? Right. As opposed to like we said, going through the minutes and going through our notes and going, oh, God, I know we talked about this. You know, what was that other thing we were going to do? Do we go home at night and go, oh, God, do we send it to somebody? But we say, write this verbatim. Well, then at that point, we might as well write it verbatim. So I can't figure out a mechanism that makes sense here. Well, that was part of why I wanted to have this conversation in case yeah. somebody had an idea about that. Or would because just to think about it a little more specifically over the next couple of weeks until we meet again to, to think, because somebody may come up with a really clever notion or a way of dividing the work and, you know, and that sort of thing. But I, I just wanted to bring it up because I knew it was a unwieldy task at best. Well, because we do have the starting point of the parking lot from agenda setting. And that there are items in the parking lot that we know we're not going to get to right. over this period of time that we know are for future reference. And so that's at least a start to start working off of that. But in what fashion do we do that? Because I don't want it to feel like just one person's assigned to this, you know, kind of task. But we need to be able to just feed things into it. So I'm just thinking about this out loud now. Is um, I was wondering if it makes sense for us, the first step is to sort of create the categories of things that you want to sort of gather information in. Sure. So it could be like future agenda items that need to be addressed. It could be board manager relations. It could be uh, public outreach. I mean, we could come up with probably seven or eight or whatever it is. And then from there, people can start to categorize their thoughts and start, and we can start to create a document that lives and comes back to the board on a regular basis after April, August 13th, you're pretty, you're meeting pretty regularly, um, almost weekly, um, that it could be a regular, so you're actually, instead of having a agenda, this, it'll give some form to this agenda item that will stay there. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to manage that quite yet. You know, it could be a Google doc, but it could also be, um, could be each board member taking a category or something that you feed things through. I'm not sure. I am belaboring this a little because I, I, I can really easily see this list coming back and then, oh, wait, which one is this dated? And is this the one that has this thing on it? And, and who's going to write down the next three paragraphs about this? And so it's, it's easy. It's not simple, but it's fairly easy to do the categorizing stuff because we have talked about the general areas, and you just listed some of them very clearly. But to f start filling in some of the meat, it I'm not sure I want to see a document, you know, that's like the select board handbook, but not the select board handbook, just kind of expanding over time. Eventually, we may find that we want to have certain people write more things to flesh more things out. But I'd, I would really encourage us, and it can't be cubby, and it can't be whatever cloud thing we're using. It has to be some easily accessible platform. I would really like us to try some electronic thing that we could, you know, when we go home, we could, while we're sitting here, we could add something to in a quick note and then say, oh, well, Ms. Brewer, you wrote about that. You better write some more about that later on. But the paper thing and then shuffling that back to you, like part of the, in the minutes and it doesn't feel very That'll, effective. That will definitely be unwieldy. And I think given where we want to spend our time, that's, you know, we want to, as I often say about technology, we want to use it to help us do the work and not get in the way. And so I think there are some opportunities for potentially technology to help us out. I think we just need to think about it a little bit and figure out what's the right tool or a good enough tool. You know, this is also one of those where the uh, perfect enemy of the good, <laughs> given our time frame that we're working in. And so, um, I mean, is Google Docs the right tool? It it might very well be, but it's easy. Right. It doesn't have to be pretty. Right. It it's like wiki pages used to be back a hundred years ago. Right. And um, people can see who added to them. And 
I guess my bigger question would be if we feel at all uneasy about because we, we continue to talk about the items here. It's not like it's, you know, hire this person to work in the summer camp. I mean, it's not <laughs> right. the kind of thing that, and besides, we have no control over that anyway. So I'm not totally worried about the open meeting law standpoint of it, but I know that we've taught IT has expressed some concern in the past about trying to have Google something, you know, when we put on the town website, this isn't, we're not responsible for this kind of document. So. I'm not sure if there's a good way for people to be able to look at it. But in the meantime, I think it would be a mistake to not use it out of fear. I think we should just go ahead and try. The other platform we have is OneNote, but that means you have to live in the Microsoft world. Yes, yeah. which we will not live in. The other option is, is um, a, like a Google Doc is probably more likely, or Google Docs, plural, but right. at least one, and then we may have to just segment it so we can right. kind of work within sections of it. And and I think there are ways to, to share it. So what it may end up being is that for the public at large, there's a, a way to get to the page, but not have That's edit book trying to figure out. And then edit I can, can look managed into by that. us. Yeah. And I can look into that as well, because uh, schools use uh, Google Docs. That's right. Write to us with your ideas, but you may not. That's right. Well, and that's, well, and that's the other thing. You put a link in that says, you know, email the right. select board with your comments on whatever section it is. I mean, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, you can always put a link. Well, I'm sure. Okay, figure it out now. Right. <laughs> it's not says, it's you said you're putting a link <laughs> where? <Right>. To what? <laughs> so anyway, so the, a little I, edgy. I think that I think that'd be really great. So could we could we get like the parking lot and like the that structure that you suggest? popped into something right mm -hmm. so I I have um, a rework of the shade tree regulation so I th for Friday so I think I will make this also a, a second piece of that and so share both of those with you um, and of course you know if we don't like the way I've structured it then obviously you can offer comment about that I think that falls into the sort of housekeeping sort of category so I'll work with the manager on trying to get something started at least that we can begin to to shape a little bit put a date on that so which I, I think can be inclusive of, of you know one of the sections can be inclusive of you know direction for the manager over the next few months as, as we move ahead. So falls under the goals category in some respects. Um, so I guess the, um, unless there's other comment about that, I think I'll just say, are there any other charter transition updates that you wanted to share with us or does anyone have to share with us uh, at this point? We've got that sort of standing item um, on the agenda. I didn't know of any, anything offhand. Um, Yes. I was just going to mention it's it's in your report, but for the public at large, if they were, had not been aware that there had been this wonderful presentation, set of presentations put together by the town manager, in case he decided not to mention it during his report later, um, since it is part of the transition that made sure that all council members were the potential you know, candidates were invited to. And there were a ton of presentations. It was a solid two hours of people getting information and Mr. Bachman making it very clear that if they had additional questions to go to him and he make sure that um, they could find ways to get more information. But he also expressed the idea, and I don't want to misstate this, so maybe I should have left you do it during your report, but I thought it was such a good idea that you, something along, he did not call it this, but something along the lines of like a Citizens Academy once the election has taken place. So again, people can get even more in-depth information before they actually get seated. And so he has put a lot of effort and thought into working with staff to figuring out how to you know kind of bring people along because some of the candidates really don't know how our form of government now works and so they don't have anything to compare the charter to and so finding out how all the different department works and everything i think people were really pleased by that set of presentations they found it really valuable and the people who couldn't be there were sad so <laughs> it was it was a really great thing to have done so thank you for doing it So uh, if there aren't other updates, then uh, I think we'll go to the next agenda item, which is the status of extended committee boards and terms. I think we've got some outstanding appointments we do need to make, which are not quite ready. Or are they, are they, are they 
the, they're not ready, but I do think we need to add the, the historical commission, which we've been advertising. We have two vacancies on that, and one of the members of the historical commission expressed concern uh, about if a demolition uh, application comes in, that they're shorthanded and they won't be able to act. And that I think you know, it's, it's a town manager appointment with the select board approval, so it can't. Ha well, it can happen if you hold a special meeting, but. I think uh, when I talked to this member of the commission, there wasn't didn't seem to be an urgency unless something came in. So I think, if, with your permission, we'd put it on the August 13th agenda and have the liaison, or I think you're the liaison, to, to meet with the candidates. We can set that up over the next couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, I was hoping that we would have hopefully have some candidates by then. I, I, think I was we're, hopeful that we were have some for. I think was, I'm okay. not sure how many. I think we're, last time I saw there were three. I think. Right. Yeah. Right. How much, uh, so once a demolition request has gone in, 35, is it 35 days? 35 days. So the sooner we act, the better because the clock could start as early as tomorrow, quite frankly, right? Right. But I've been asked to plan, you know, the, I, the inspection services or the second floor, if there's anything like that that does come in, let us know so we right. know that there's right. more time that we need to pay attention. Because one of the members will be on vacation during much of August as well. Right. So, but again, people can still put in their citizen activity form, the CAF, yes. if they are interested in serving. So we please encourage people to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two vacancies, so there's gonna be ample opportunity for other people to join in. Great. Fantastic. Is there anything else from anyone on? Yes. Uh, just by way of information, and sometimes I get a, uh, a question from a committee saying, you know, we're at quorum or close to it, should we be at quorum plus one? What happened to the application? I said, well, we've been kind of busy, you know, and things take their time. So just want to assure the public that we are monitoring the incoming citizen applications and we are trying to attend to these, as you've said, in, especially when there's any urgency involved. Uh, just as, as, a, as a footnote, I was somewhat puzzled to hear earlier tonight in the meeting a reference to someone who has joined the committee but waiting to be appointed by the council. I'm sorry, you don't join the committee till you're appointed by us. <laughs> so, you know, if if people want to join, they should put in applications, but I think we need to be clear about if the public is not clear about what constitutes membership and voting membership and quorum and all that. I, there have been numerous emails and town announcements, but again, people are, are free, of course, to attend meetings, but they're public meetings, but to be a member of a committee is a very special thing. That means there's been an official designation. To, to be fair, I believe that the people that were referenced this evening have in fact submitted CAFs, but we haven't acted on them because they already do have quorum plus one on that committee. And so they've done all the things they need to do. They just need to be clear that if they're voting, say, on you know, 300 or $500 or something to put in a regulation, that that person really shouldn't be voting <laughs> because they're not a member, treating themselves as a, you know, a guest. You know, if I could just clarify that, we've had situations in the past sometimes where someone one or more persons on a committee uh, encourage one of their friends to apply, and then there's an assumption that because one has put in a CAF and ah. there's one vacancy and one application, one has an automatic right to be appointed, and it's as certain as the sunset uh, tonight and the sunrise tomorrow, and that's not the case again. There's, you know, so an application is no guarantee of appointments, all I'm saying. Thank you for that. But certainly we don't want to discourage anyone from applying. No, 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 no. Application in. So country. that's great. So why don't we take another break for a bit of reading about minutes at this point, because I think that'll give, unless you yeah. have finally crafted a, a motion, I think this will give you an opportunity to do the motion for those things under licenses that we need to do. And, and, uh, and so I think that for those of us that haven't read the minutes as closely, that we take a few minutes right now and do that. Yes. That would be helpful. And I actually do have one question about one of the items under the consent calendar too, that's not one we've already discussed. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you do too. <laughs> I, yeah, we have to okay. work our way through, through that, I think. Okay. So we'll resume the meeting. Um, so we have uh, uh, a number of things on our consent calendar and a couple other items under our licenses, public way, and metered parking reservation. And so I think what we should do, and, I, and we'll come back to minutes in a minute, I think. Just a there's significant changes, but I did want people to get to read them. I have some changes. So separate from that, the minutes, um, I think what 
I would like to start with it because I think there's some items to either go into or come out of the consent calendar. So um, I would, I don't know if we need to formally move and take action on that or should we probably make a specific motions to include or exclude certain things from our consent calendar and then vote that or? I think whoever makes a motion on the consent calendar just includes the ones they want to include unless someone says, please pull out item one, for instance. And I do want to note, as I mentioned to the chair, that the uh, two items that were discussed earlier when uh, Mr. Kell and Mr. Brody were here were not actually mem parts of the consent calendar, so I will move them as separate items, as I will explain when we get to them. So we should concentrate on the items listed under 7A, which is the consent calendar items. So is that items one through, f I through five, one through yes. five is what you're referring to. Yep. So I would like to pull out item one. Are there any other items that would like to be pulled out? If, if not, then we can potentially take a motion on the consent calendar as amended. So I move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for the July 23rd, 2018 agenda being items two through five. As presented. As presented, two through five as presented. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion on those items? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so shall we take up Item number one. So item one is a request from the University of Massachusetts for a one-day liquor license. Um, and there are some photos. Uh, Ms. Mills has been working feverishly to try to get, um, oh, here it is material for you no one from the university could be present because we anticipated this to be this is an unusual one and our the university always has one day liquor licenses before the board but this one is unusual because it's located outside in lot 33 along the tree line so um, Ms. Mills has done a really good job at getting maps that show exactly where lot 33 is where along the tree line uh, it is intended they're intending to do to have the um, beer and this is part of a event called called pain in the mass bicycle tour and it's it's the people who will be participating in this uh, beer tent are only the riders you will need to use uh, you will need to have a, a um, this is a 100 and 150 mile bike ride when you conclude the bike ride there's a barbecue and you have a ticket for a beer at, at this beer um, tent um, so the stadium drive is a road that is more like a driveway off of University Drive, and it's scheduled for August 11th from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. I think that captures pretty much everything. So um, I was just noting in, in our the formal application, um, at the bottom where it says approved police chief, et cetera, et cetera, it, it, that isn't currently signed. I just didn't know whether or not the chief has gotten back to your office about that. And okay. Bill says that he has. Okay. Were there questions from the board members relative to that one and its location and, and is, so the TOC is doing the event much like they do many other events on campus. Yes. So it's odd. That's why I wanted to pull it out. And I appreciate all the extra work staff's had to do chasing this down to get more details for something that's outside like this. Um, I appreciate that it's not during the school year, so that's something. Three to 10 seems long but you're saying it's a 150 mile bike ride? 
there's there are 50 bike riders. I think 35. I think they're they have about 20 signed up so far for the 150 mile bike ride. I'm not sure the. I think the registration for the 100 mile bike ride. It can be a lot more than that, but they have a limit on the 150 mile bike ride. You have to prove that you can actually do 150 miles. So my follow-up question is, since I have a, some vague familiarity from my husband's past participation in Pedals to Pints, where they go to actual breweries <laughs> individual <laughs> uh, on longer and shorter bike rides, depending on how many breweries you go to, um, this is weird because it doesn't end in a brewery. It ends in a parking lot that has beer. And so if it was ending in a brewery over the period 3 p.m. to 10 p.m., you know, obviously that'd be that. Um, it just seems like a really long period of time for them to be serving alcohol, and I'm not sure why it needs to go that late. When we, when we have, we've, I think we've expressed various degrees of comfort or discomfort with the tailgating that goes on in the UMass parking lots normally um, during games, but those are not nighttime events; those are day afternoon events, and it's light and it'll be pretty light most of this time too but it's just a little odd and I'm not sure how we feel about that so um, if you have access to um, any kind of computer device right now uh, I actually did some research on this and I'm very comfortable with the request but pain in the mass.org is a website for this event in its entirety, and it includes many things, um, including the routes and um, what their plans are, event details, um, which includes a comprehensive um, calendar. This is a, the 150-mile the event takes people um, riding all the way to the top of Mount Greylock and back. Um, I can't imagine that there are going to be many riders after that length of a ride who are going to be able to handle more than one beer and <laughs> still be standing. Uh, but um, this really is for serious riders, and they have a detailed um, calendar of activities for the event itself within the, that website that I gave to you. And uh, you know, I think that part of it is, is that just because of the length of the event that they assume that people are gonna not come in at one time, they are gonna come in at varied times. They are, it is one ticket that is being given to each individual to get a single serving, a single beer. So. It's not like they're having an open event, I don't believe. That's where I would disagree. I think that they're getting a stub to go in and get one beer, and then there usually is the availability of continued alcohol service. And so I'd like that. I mean, that was right. If it's just one, who cares? I mean, <laughs> run it 24 hours as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate that they say that they get one stub to let them in the beer tent, that I'm not sure it makes sense to run an alcohol service for that many riders with one beer each. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not convinced that doesn't mean they can't. And I'm not saying it's bad if they continue to serve because they have shown themselves able to handle this in many other settings. It is still top of the campus. But I find it hard to believe that you get one beer and then you're done. That's just not how things usually work. You get one as a, yay, you did it. <laughs> and then after that, there. But I'm not saying people will be in the mood. The ones who do the 150 miles, which won't be everyone, but the ones who do the 150 miles definitely probably won't be in the mood to have multiples. But I guess I'm okay with it. I don't know if it says one beer. It's, uh, the that lets the wristband in. lets them in to the beer tent. Yeah, it, it's not clear because it says with one stub that will allow them in the beer tent. I got to assume they're going to let them buy beer because otherwise it would not be worth their time to set this up mm -hmm. if they were just giving everybody one free beer. 
Okay, that there's there's no money to be made there. <laughs> Selling the subsequent beers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't get the idea that um, the sale of beers and money making enterprise was a part of this. Um, I think that it, it struck me that it was uh, upon their return because other things that. Um, they have in there is the overnight riders who are staying in town for the next day. They have an event at Johnny's Tavern, which is, um, you know, a later event. So it's not like it's being designed as a long-term event. It's when you look at the calendar that's on here. So um, for all those reasons, and the fact that this is... Uh, about a couple of serious charities fundraising for a couple of um, health-related charities. I think that it's a worthy event, and uh, we should do whatever we can to make it happen. And I, my first reaction was not dissimilar to what is, Ms. Brewer expressed. I thought, oh gosh, is this like tailgating? But then I immediately realized that all my problems with tailgating being recognized, this is not that. My guess is as well, if they're doing a, a barbecue, you know, again, the writers will come in over a period of time. You know, the elite writers will get in earlier, but, you know, the not so elite writers will <laughs> trickle in later. Um, but again, I think they may be projecting till 10 p.m. just to be conscientious of the fact that it might there might be people that, you know, arrive much, much later. You know, if they break down or there's a lot of things can go, you know, I've watched a little of the Tour de France lately and so all sorts of things can go awry on a road race. Um, but anyway, but I think, uh, and I, I think that the, the, other, uh, the other thing is I, that I think about is, you know, how given that it's outside, is it fairly well contained and it sounds yes. as though it is, which I, makes me less concerned about nice the time length and, and yes. so I think it's, it's all right, so. And it is a segue because then they, uh, we, again, when you look at the schedule, I go to the Berkshire Dining Common for dinner then, which is labeled from 5 to 8 p.m. So, you know, I really do think that it's designed for sort of a very quick reception after they get back and before they head to the Berkshire Dining Common and then if they wish to go into Johnny's Tavern in town. So I would like to make the motion uh, to approve item 7I, uh, A, 7A, subsection Roman numeral 1I, which is labeled as I, as presented. Second. Second. Is there further discussion? Yes. Could, could we just make it really clear in the motion that it's for participants in the bike, like right where it's between four and pain, so it's only, so it's really clear. It's just for people who are in that bike tour. It's not just for people who wander by. I mean, we're, because it's outside. I right. mean, that, that's, that's the reason. I mean, normally I know it's participants at the old chapel and it's participants on the, you know, on the deck and right. on the roof. You know, it seems to me that it, uh, at some point there's trust that gets involved, and I think this is a point to give trust. Okay. Future reference. All right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Who seconded? Uh, Jim did. Pass on the comments, however, to the license commission uh, <laughs> may be formulated because this will be their future responsibilities and what to scrutinize. That's right. It is a question of what to scrutinize. Uh, so would you like to on, on uh, the 7 um, B, I'm going to take them separately. I am going to move to approve 
move to adopt the motion as stated on the motion sheet presented with the following additions. After the word application in the first line to add uh, of Amherst Live a nonprofit corporation. Yes, and uh, with the comma, so it's of Amherst Live, comma, nonprofit corporation, comma. And then in what now is the second line of the motion, there's an address list and then which ends with the word with with the town Amherst. Um, uh, for an event limited to participants over the age of 21, comma, with alcohol sales managed by Bistro 63 Monkey Bar LLC. And uh, then the word, uh, let's see, It was on, I think we could change the word for to on. August. Did, did you have executive director for you, Mr. Brody? Yes, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's it. It's, um, it's the application is of Amherst Live, nonprofit corporation. So. Uh, he needs Oliver to be listed. Brody, director, is listed at the end. Executive director, but he needs to, it needs to be clear. Well, you're, sorry, item C doesn't say Amherst Live in it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was tacking well, it on to the end of the. Well, I will come well. back to C in a second. Okay. C if you'll tack it in motion. somewhere. If you'll tack C's it in somewhere. C is a separate motion. Um, I was just trying to tack them on the, the same place. Additions to, to B. Is there a second? Okay, so we've got a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And one absent. So it's unanimous with one absent. And then my, uh, for motion C, again, I am moving to adopt the motion as presented with the, the following additions. After the word application in the first line of Amherst Live, a nonprofit corporation, and after the word, the name of the town Amherst in the second line, uh, for an event limited to participants over the age of 21 on August 4. 2018 rain date will be August 18, 2018, and everything else. And again, including Oliver Brody, director. Is there a second? There is a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 None, so there's uh, unanimous with one absent. So it takes care of section seven of our agenda. We'll move on to approval of minutes. And so we got a series of one, two, three, four, five minutes, I believe. Somewhere in the stacks of paper. Yes, Ms. Brew. So as you all know, I normally refrain from getting involved in the minutes. And as soon as you hear my edits, you'll know why. Um, is that I, and I, I do think that Mr. Steinberg does an amazing job on our behalf. I also think that it's important that when people try and Google our minutes and when people try and read our minutes, they don't have to go look at another document to have any idea what we're talking about. So a couple of comments. Um, on April, if we could just, do you mind if I just go through them? Go through so them. basically, in terms of others present at our meetings, I think it's really important to say when people are reporters for newspapers. So we say Scott Mersbach, Daily Hampshire Gazette, and that just carries through on all of these. Um, 
that when someone's representing a committee, particularly if they're a committee chair, that that's listed right there and others present without having to go and read the body. And when someone's staff, that their title is called out, as it often is with Mr. Mooring, for example, and with the town manager, that is especially relevant on May 7th, but it also applies to April 30th, where we say, we want to say Joel Bard's town council, because there's no reason why somebody two years from now is going to know that. So. Um, Joel could, you know, move to Australia or something. So they may not realize that. So I think that those are important, just in terms of like page numbers and dates. <laughs> and then substantively, more so, even though I think that's important too, is it took me a minute to understand what we meant in paragraph under vote and assigned positions and paragraph two, Mr. Slaughter discussed Article Twenty Eight. He noted the reason town meeting could vote on this article is that the Agricultural Commission was on, and I was like, what? Why do they need permission to vote on the article? So I think somewhere in there, we're saying during the charter transition. I think that was the context in which that statement was made, because town meeting could always vote on articles or not. But we talk about that in one of the other sets of minutes, and so I think just finding a way to work wedge those couple of words in there, I think will be clearer to people in the future as opposed to, so town meeting's going to vote on this not or why. And at the bottom of that page, when it says town meeting updates, Mr. Bachelman introduced town attorney Joe Bard, who reviewed his memo on Article 1. We need to say what Article 1 is. People don't have to go look at another document to find out what Article 1 is. Also, if people Googled the name of the article, these minutes wouldn't come up, which would be unfortunate. I would also reference the special town meeting date. That would be a good idea, too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, do you have something you want to suggest there right there? one is which I know both warnings <laughs> I always have to look it up I'm looking here in the press to see that the press is correct but my instinct that, that, that that's seems right. like a mistake the town uh, yes his is the one without the C it is a different Good individual eyes. that has the C Good so spotting yes. ran rule Lombard. and then in the first paragraph yes so it's in the Good spotting. Were there other edits to the minutes of the 30th? If not, let's carry on. I presume you have a few others. Yeah. Which is perfectly fine. I'm not. Yeah. Those were the worst of it, I promise. Okay. So, May 1st. Mm -hmm. Obviously, just Daily Hampshire Gazette at the top. But um, it was the special town. I think we can just put in there, Mr. Slaughter noted the special town meeting voted to authorize. Why don't we just say special town meeting passed Article 1? And in this case, it talks about special legislation, so I'm not as picky that it has to have the exact title of the article there. But just saying that town meeting voted to authorize the select board to file special legislation without any reference to a particular article. Seems like a mistake. What did you want to say? Something along the lines of t special town meeting passed Article 1 authorizing something like that. Something that sounds good to you when you do the edit. It's not like I ever want to see this again. <laughs> Just <laughs> special legislation is in there, so I'm not as picky that you have to re repeat article, special legislation. And if anybody else has anything for May 1, I will make my point. So May 2nd is, again, just Daily Hampshire Gazette. But um, it's not just a general bylaw to address excessive noise. It was to address excessive noise at a gun range. And so we should say something, some reference to that. Yeah, so that was the title from the, yeah, I get from that, the warrant. But that's not really helpful. I mean, that this these are minutes that are, like, to just it says nothing in here about the gun range. That's 
and that is the subject of the issue. I, I hear what you're saying. We titled it that because we did. But um, say something about where it is, that it's a gun range, something. Otherwise, people are just going to assume it's about people partying. <laughs> They're not going to have any idea what this is about. Getting the gun range in that first sentence is price addition because the quote is <laughs> actual petition name is in there as well. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. May 7th, the LA Hampshire Gazette thing again. Um, the third paragraph from the bottom, I think if we're gonna, when we do have split votes, we should say who the opposed was. That just seems like a thing to do. Just in case we forgot. Just, just the opposed? However you want to do it. I mean, we don't, right? We don't have those rules. Just like there is not a rule that says who for who who made the motion and who seconded it, but it's been our practice to do it for a while. So, I'm open, but it just seems like why don't you go ahead and I guess say both. You may as well say both. Sorry. So rare. What if I forget? Think it was me. <laughs> who was it? Well, I mean, this is all there is. The motion sheet's right. gone, right. right? So, right. so. Yeah. yeah. I believe it was me, but yeah, I probably. I think it was you too, but I don't. Maybe I six months from now, I won't remember. <laughs> and then on on May 9th, all I it was just the two public art people. Just I know it says it in the paragraph, but I think it would just as good practice for others present that those are committee members and that Scott's from the Dale Hampshire Gazette. That's all. See, it wasn't bad. But it is a great reminder that when we know what we're talking about, it's like obvious, <laughs> at least right. minutes say. But right. um, so if everybody's good with those changes. I'd like to make a motion, I think, unless someone else has any others. Go right ahead. Then I move to approve the minutes from the following select board meetings, April 30th, 2018, May 1st, 2018, May 2nd, 2018, May 7th, 2018, and May 9th, 2018, as amended. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And this with one absent. Thank you to everybody for getting those together. It's so nice to have those be current. I think we particularly need to thank Mr. Bachman, Ms. Puppel, yes. Ms. Mills. It's fantastic to get that out of the way. There's more to come. It's good to hear. Unfortunately. <laughs> For better or worse. All right, so next up on our agenda is the, uh, the town manager's report. Okay. Would you like to share with us? There are a few things. So uh, Ms. Brewer already mentioned that we had the counselor candidate information meeting um, and we you I sent out the slide deck that we used that night and to all the council candidates whether they are able to attend or not um, we had a really good attendance um, a, a lot of department heads wanted to be there they wanted to see who the council candidates were it was very interesting um, and um, it was strictly about sharing information about each of our sort of um, our um, functional areas uh, like the police, the fire, the DPW, things like that. And we also had um, the superintendent of schools came and the director of the library, and everybody had a certain amount of minutes that they could utilize, and they most people stuck with it, but it was a solid, we were hoping to do it in under two hours, but it was a solid two hours of presentation. Very few questions at the end. Um, I think because it was two hours, <laughs> people were ready to go home. So again, a lot of people put a lot of work into that and thank all the staff who, who put the effort in. Um, and, uh, it's a, it's a, and also that presentation will serve as a basis for other things that we go out to the public and wanna share information. Um, really proud to announce tonight that uh, the town has received a $25,000 design grant from the Stanton Foundation for the dog park. Uh, this will go out into the press tomorrow. Um, this, the reason this is important is, is $25,000 is important, but also that almost always leads to a couple hundred thousand dollar grant for the construction of the dog park, because once they invest in the design, they like to invest in the construction. So uh, again, uh, 
Dave Zomack has been nurturing this along, cultivating the relationship with the Stanton Foundation. They gave him glowing response to his the material he submitted. They they had told him that they had never seen one as developed and had as much community participation as we had. So real kudos to to David and to uh, the um, to the dog park task force. Um, continue to work with a new vendor on the solar. That's uh, it's a we are now out of the SREC and into the smart program. So the economics of the proposal changes. There are things that they, the new vendor wants us to change. For instance, go to a 40 year from a 20 year, we're hesitant to do that. Um, it's, uh, um, so we are continuing to meet with, with the new vendor on that. Um, wayfinding signs are, have been delivered to the bid. They're paying for the first two wayfinding signs that will go into the roundabout on Triangle Street and East Pleasant Street. And you should see those up um, within the next few weeks with a, uh, a stone wall and some plantings around them to sort of set them off in a nice way. They look really attractive. Um, want to mention that the, um, the home minister from the Tibetan community had come to visit the town of Amherst, uh, and Ms. Brewer was able to be there on very short notice because I didn't really grasp what this was until I read it in the paper that morning that it was a pretty big deal and that this this guy was actually a part of the uh, Dalai Lama's ministry. So um, we got the chair of the um, Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Director to be there. And it was a really nice uh, little conversation that we had a lot, even went over the time that they had allocated for it. So they had also gone to Northampton and had representatives from the Amherst Tibetan community thanking the town for having such a long standing um, support for the uh, Tibetan people. Um, we've been working on, and this is, I just got a draft of a college voting FAQ that we want to share out. Uh, the university and the two colleges have all agreed that they'll share, the, share this out. This is just a quick draft. Um, it it's needs updating and all kinds of things, but just something that will appeal to um, college students to figure out, are they registered? How do they register? Um, when do they vote? How do they vote? All those types of things. So it's, um, that's will be the sort of graphic that goes along with it with a lot of links that people can learn more about. Um, just want to announce that Jake's um, restaurant in North Amherst received its license today. They, they, everything is clean. Everything, they've gone through all the hurdles that they need to go through. So very quick uh, time frame from all of our inspectors, the health inspector, everybody. So they're, they're good to go. Um, had a very successful um, town manager coffee with principal assessor David Burgess at Kelly's restaurant. And what's happening, I mentioned this before, is that we're starting to see council candidates show up and sort of ask questions and listen and participate. And it, it actually makes it more interesting in a lot of ways um, because uh, people feel like there's a slightly larger audience for them to talk about things. Um, the um, oh, had the, the president, the new president of Hampshire College, came in to visit in town hall, and it was her second day in the job, which was a um, really impressive uh, thing. That we were a little disappointed it wasn't the first day of the job that she showed up, as David Zomack <laughs> said. But um, we were able to talk to her about. Um, we spent a good solid hour with her, and there's a lot of connections I have with her in her previous life, and. Um, and I think that uh, this is, so I think she's gonna be really dynamic for the college and I'm very hopeful um, that she'll have a lot of relations with the, um, with the town. She wanted to, ha she had very good experience with the city of Somerville with a program she did on uh, nutrition for the city of Somerville and believes very strongly in the connection um, with the town between the community and the college. And probably the other thing is that she's a trail runner. She was excited, most excited to get a trail map from the assistant town manager that showed all the trails that she could run on. Um, the, um, and we've been asked to host a, uh, the Cannabis Control Commission has reached out to us to host a forum that they wanna hear have in mid-August. They're looking at August 14th or 15th. 
um, they're targeting communities that they call high impact communities and Amherst is listed as one of our one of the high impact communities in order to educate people about social equity of the cannabis um, industry and trying to educate people in our town and in neighboring communities in Western Massachusetts so we of course said yes to that uh, I think it's gonna be a pretty big deal they anticipate several hundred people showing up so we'll be working, we just found out about this today, we'll be working with them to, um, to accommodate them. We think it's a good thing for us to host. Uh, the 14th. We, we haven't chosen a day yet. We're looking at either the 14th or 15th, and they're looking at like three hours from like six to nine, seven to 10, five to eight, something in that range. If you have preferences, let me know. We uh, will probably have to use do the school, I think, because um, I don't think this room accommodates depends how many people if they said 200 um, this this room can't accommodate it um, although they had asked about using this room so I'm not sure if they understand how large it is, the size of it a uh, few other thing I don't dates I want to mention one is the um, Fort Hill auto, auto body is having their ribbon cutting for, as a new business on at 213 College Street at 12 noon on Wednesday um, on Thursday, the Community Development Block Grant will make an announcement at 10 a.m. at the State House. Usually that's good news for the town. Uh, we don't have any staff who are able to attend if any select board members are interested in going. It's kind of a long distance to go just to be on a photo op on the stairs with the governor, but or it might just be the lieutenant governor, not just, but that would be equally good to have the lieutenant governor. Um, what day was that again? Thursday at 10 a.m. Um, Next Monday, there's a food security. I think you've all received the invitation from Governor, from Congressman McGovern's uh, office for food security at the regional, at the middle school at 1.30. Uh, there'll be some, some kind of forum, not sure exactly the, what shape that will be taking. I think they'll have someone from the food services at the high school, um, from the regional school district. Hopefully also our health director will be on the panel as well. Um, at the end of um, August, uh, you've been invited, or I think you've been invited to the International Student Welcome Reception at the Amherst Women's Club, which is always a good thing. And then on September 1st, I want to let you know that there'll be the traditional adventure into Amherst that the Business Improvement District sponsors, and that we've scheduled for them to use Kendrick Park um, that day from 12 to 2 as a sort of a staging area for, for the the trolley to bring students into town. And I think that pretty much sums up everything. Oh, just on, on your, I think you should have received this campus control commission thing that should have been on your desks. And that's it. So quick question for you is, is an upcoming cup of Joe gonna be at Jake's? <laughs> <laughs> They've already asked me, yes, it will be. <laughs> Once they're open. Once yeah. they're actually yeah. open. Yes. Uh, are there other questions for the manager relative to his, his report to us? That sounds like a resounding no, so we'll, so we'll move on to select board member reports. Being the quiet time of year, does anyone have any reporting to do of select board related things they've done and people they've seen? Yes. So not having had a chance to ask the town manager, just like he didn't have a chance to tell me about that event in August yet, um, because he just found out about it today, associated with CCC. So Ms. Kruger and I are going to a taping of WGBY's Turning Points. This time we aren't being interviewed, unfortunately. We're in the audience, but we obtained a third ticket, and I haven't heard if Mr. Kravitz is using that third ticket, but I'm presuming yes, and so we'll talk about that offline. But um, anyway, they invited us. I tried... I guess I wasn't forceful enough in saying we should be on the expert panel, but we got ourselves invited into the audience, so I suppose that's something. So that's Thursday night in Springfield. And just prior to that, I actually have a meeting of the Hampshire County Select Boards Association Executive Committee, which is uh, normally a four-member body, but 
two of the people on that body were not reelected to select boards this spring. So that makes things complicated, and the fact that I'm vice president and we aren't going to have a select board in a couple of months. So that basically leaves one officer on that board. And so if you have any thoughts um, that you'd like to share with me offline about the future of the Hampshire County Select Boards Association and how they might move on without the support of Amherst, et cetera, especially since their vice president's also going away. Um, that would be great, but yeah. And I know that we've attempted to attend some of their <coughs> events in the past, and we've tried to combine them with Mass Selectman's Association events when they're held out here, and we just haven't been particularly hugely successful at that. But there is still some money in the bank account, and we're just trying to figure out how to like let it hold over to like the next group of people maybe that gets elected in the spring. And, like so many organizations, things ebb and flow. So I think those are the two main things beyond all the dates that... Mr. Bachelman has already mentioned to us. I think it'll pass. All right. Mr. Wald has been in Prague, so <laughs> <laughs> no, not entirely. Uh, and I haven't gone to any thing. Uh, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust did not officially meet because we didn't have a quorum. So we are going to have an official meeting this Thursday if we can get a quorum. But there's a couple things we need to vote on relative to some continued due diligence at the East Street School, uh, a couple other things, um, uh, one of which is uh, potential to have uh, to pose a series of questions to candidates of the uh, council uh, relative to affordable housing and, and other items of that nature. Um, so we've got a meeting this Thursday night if people want to come and, and uh, see what we're up, up to. Should be a fairly short meeting, however. Um, other than that, I don't think I have anything else. So that's my member report. So unless there's anything else, um, I did receive this evening this from the Hampshire Council of Governance, which I will share out to each of you. Uh, the one thing that caught my eye in skimming it over is that they've, uh, on May 24th, the council sought to remove as many barriers as possible to that goal of getting more people to join and voted to reduce HCG's membership dues to $1. So it's getting cheap to belong to the Hampshire Council of Governments. Um, so I will uh, get copies of that to, to each of you if you haven't received that already via email, but we can look that over and decide whether we want to consider it more seriously or not. Yes. I would request that the town manager report to us at some point what he thinks. My initial gut reaction is it's still too expensive. Um, so um, I... I very seriously believe that and do not think this is the right time to be joining that organization. So if he has other thoughts or other opportunities that are, it's important to be part of them for, then I'd love to hear that. But my assumption is that sounds nice, but no thank you. So if there's not anything else, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we're adjourned at 9.39 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you to Amherst Media for being with us this evening as well, as always.